gone insane. An upside-down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. calculated to keep you in suspense today's show is brought to you by casper get fifty dollars towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper forward slash dana and using the promo code dana c-a-s-p-e-r casper.com and also by harry's Please visit harrys.com and use the promo code DANA to save $5 off your first purchase. It's the most wonderful time of the year. My favorite time of year, my favorite month, my favorite holiday, and my favorite episode of the podcast to put together. This year's is no exception. I can't summon the Great Pumpkin, but I can squash any fears that this episode is anything less than awesome. Get it? Pumpkin. Squash. Big guns. Patton Oswalt is my guest. We're going to talk about the horror movies that made us who we are. Show them to your kids. Make them one of us. One of us. Lori Jacobson is here. Lori wrote the best book I have ever read about supernatural doings in the heart of Tinseltown. Hollywood haunted. Find out who couldn't take the hint and stuck around after they died. Also, actor, writer, and cinema collector extraordinaire, Bob Burns. You may not know Bob by name, but he has had a documentary and two books written about him. He is one of the most fascinating people I know, and if you are a fan of all things Halloween, then you, like me, will soon be looking to Bob as the mentor that I do. He is a truly extraordinary gentleman with an extraordinary story. Also joining us is filmmaker Frank Dietz, the maker of said documentary, entitled Beast Wishes. Where can you see me? In person? On a comedy stage? I will be at Laughs in Kirkland, Washington, October 15th, 16th, and 17th. I will be at the Laugh Shop in Calgary, Alberta. That's in Canada, a totally different country. November 5th, 6th, and 7th. And I will be at the Great Scott in my hometown of Boston, Massachusetts, on November 13th. I will also be in Arlington, Virginia, at the Arlington Draft House, December 4th, And fifth, go to the live appearances page at danagool.com for details and ticket links. Last but not least, on October 16th of this year, in theaters and on video on demand, the film Tales of Halloween, a horror anthology featuring the top tier fright filmmakers at work today. I am joined in the cast of that movie by Greg Grunberg. He's in Star Wars. Serena Vincent, James Duvall, Lisa Marie, John Savage, John Landis, Joe Dante, Adrian Barbeau, Pat Healy, hi Pat, Mick Garris. I will not tell you what happens to me in this movie, but I will tell you what I learned on the set. If it's five o'clock in the morning and you have a bucket of fake blood that's been sitting out all night, when that stuff finally comes out of the pump, it's cold. Tales of Halloween. I am so happy to be in that movie and to be a part of your October podcast queue. There they are. Trick or treat. All right, teens and swingers. We've reached the part in our show where we're going to let our lead singer, Mr. Mike, bore his love out of his cage. 
Welcome to the Day the Good Halloween Hour. I'm lying. It will be way more than an hour. But whatever you do, don't touch that dial. That would be a grave mistake. <laughs> now it's dark and I'm alone. But I won't be afraid in my doom. In my doom. In my doom. In my doom. <laughs> Well, Eastern Europe got the greatest goblins, ghouls, and ghosts. When the workman growls from his bloody jowls, man, I dig his howl the most. Oh, oh Drac, he's got such a winning smile, drives a stake right through my chest. And that mummy man up from Egypt land, he's got a rap that's just the best. I wish they all could be Transylvania ghouls. I wish they all could be Transylvania. I wish they all could be Transylvania ghouls. <laughs> Oh yeah, I like ghouls, ghouls, ghouls. Oh, I think ghouls. Yeah, I think ghouls, ghouls. Oh, Transylvania ghouls. My guest on a beautiful. 94 degree autumn day, a man who needs no introduction, Mr. Patton Oswalt. This is the sound of my voice, but you knew that. Now, Patton, you just wrote a book about your movie fetish. Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. When you were growing up, what were the movies when you're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? What were the first movies that rang your bell? Okay, the first movie that rang my bell in terms of, oh, I want to make movies now um, was I, – I, this is very cliche, but it was Star Wars. Uh-huh. It was, oh, okay, this is – I want to do stuff like that. I want to – that looks fun. Sure, you know, like, yeah, totally, like, yeah. Like other movies up to that point had affected me because they were funny or they made me sad. I remember when I was really little, I would watch – that Jackie Gleason movie, Gigo, and I would get really sick. Wow. I thought P- – just – because they – back then they just showed movies and they, they didn't know. Yeah. And I <laughs> yeah, would just I remember, watch yeah. and I got really sad. Like everyone's being mean to him and he has no friends. <laughs> that really messed me up. And then I also remember when I was really young, my mom says I think when I was four, they would show the old King Kong on TV. Yeah. And I would – I was so terrified by it. That I would stand in front of the TV and I had like literally like a pacifier in my mouth. Because of the background. obvious racial overtones? They, oh, yeah, exactly. It's just, it just, I'm like, my God, this is exactly what's going on in Watts right now. <laughs> um, I was screaming, turn the page at the screen. Oh, my it God. Was this book and I didn't want the thing to, oh, man. But That's amazing. But so the ones if, that, that. By like, the way, there's a, there's a couple of ginormously racist chunks of the original King Kong. Oh, good Lord. What is it? He says he'll give you seven of his women for Anne. Yeah, blondes are scarce around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get it. They're all African. Yeah, right? I, thank you. <laughs> um, if you're talking about, like, I'm constantly going to movies. It was Star Wars. And then I also remember, for some reason, my friend's dad took me and my friend to go see the animated Lord of the Rings, that Ralph sure. Action one. Yeah. But it was sold out. So the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers was playing. The Leonard Nimoy Donald the Leonard Sutherland, Nimoy Donald Sutherland one. Again, the father not trying to be mean or anything. was like, well, I watched the, this movie growing up. They remade yeah. it. Great. Fine for kids. Directed by Philip Kaufman, Philip who Kaufman. I believe wrote the story for Raiders of the Lost, Lost Ark. Ark. And was fired from the outlaw Josie Wales. And that was taken over by Clint Eastwood directing. I didn't know yes. that. Yes, and um, Philip Kaufman has an amazing career. Made one, made a very weird early superhero movie called Fearless Frank with John Voight as this guy that dies and kind of gets brought back to life Frankenstein style and then goes and fights crime. It oh is my one of the gosh. most bizarre. It's very weird. And then Midnight Cowboy, which John Voight was originally a superhero movie, but his only power <laughs> was getting blown by Bob Balaban. Yeah. <laughs> The remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers was my first experience with shit doesn't work out at the end of this. 
The good guys completely lose. The world is taken over. Veronica Cartwright is left screaming while our hero has been turned into a pod person, and that's the end of the movie. Right. And it's terrifying, and that movie messed me up. That was my first experience in there are some movies you shouldn't go to if you're not ready for it. Yeah, if you're not ready to be a kid. So for weeks afterwards, I had horrible nightmares, and I had a plant in my room that one night I threw out of the window because I kept thinking it was going to drop pods on the ground. Oh, really? Yeah, I was really freaked out. I saw it again. Five years ago, thinking, well, I'm, I'm older now. I'll see. You know, no, it's very powerful still. It's so scary, and and the dog like, dude is the really goddamn creepy. the dog with the head of the dude on it, banjo. Yeah, fuck that, fuck all. Of that. <laughs> but even early on, when you watch that movie, watch the early scenes. One, there's a creepy moment where Robert Duvall, as a priest, is just swinging on a swing set alone in a park at the beginning for no reason. That could be any movie. That could be any movie, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then, all in the background, even from the very first shots, you see people way in the distance running with packs of people chasing them. Oh, no. And you hear I see, distant I have to watch screams. That again. And watch as people walk. They'll like walk by dumpsters, and there's just piles of dried up pods stuffed wow, into these did dumpsters. not notice so that it's at all. all happening behind them, and they're just going on with their everyday San Francisco lives. Right, like right, right. But from the get-go, there is weird stuff going on. Again, I thought, oh, I'll go see it as an adult, and I'll have this cathartic, okay, it wasn't, it was even scarier when I saw it oh, as an adult, because I have to watch it again. he just lays in. So, And of course, the Kevin McCarthy cameo, in the right in the middle, where he's at the window yeah. going, you're next. I think someone, if either Stephen King or Roger Ebert says, he looks like he's been running and screaming since the end of the first movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. has been running that long. He looks that crazed. And it's just, ugh. Yeah. I was really prepped for movies ending horribly, and I know this is such a broken record with me, it's barely worth saying, but because I saw Planet of the Apes, oh, yeah, and yeah, I, was yeah. like, I was like, oh, well, the, the ending of this is awful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all of this those, is terrifying. The, the good guys lose. The endings of the first four Planet of the Apes movies are Earth was destroyed, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and then in the second movie, it's Oh, Earth was really destroyed. Really destroyed. They'd had a second yeah. chance. Yeah. Because at the end of the first movie, you realize, well, maybe the apes are kind of the good guys. They're the ones going, no yeah. more humans. Boy, did they screw that up. Yep. But then mutant humans go, no, no, we got one yep. more shot, we and we're going to screw this up. The, the ending of the, the third the, one the is, last... let's shoot a baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I just remember watching Beneath the Planet of the Apes on TV and That is a fucked up movie. It is a fucked up movie and the final image of Taylor's um James Franciscus's bloody handprint on the control as oh, it, no, it's it, Charlton Heston's. Is it Heston's? It, yeah. As it fades I to think, bright I white. So know. it fades <laughs> through blood. It's bright white. It's it's a nuclear blast yeah. fading blood out. And then it's it's two o'clock and now it's time for yeah. the Abbott Costello. <laughs> yeah. It was just this. And then Saturday the voice of the haunted mansion. <laughs> Everything's dead. <laughs> Thanks for coming to Pacific Theaters. WDCA Channel Twenty, Bethesda's great entertainer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh? Our what? movie today is McKenna's Gold, <laughs> which was always the movie when you stayed home from school sick. Um, were you into horror movies as a kid specifically? or Very much so, yeah. Because we had a thing every Saturday afternoon. It was an Abbott and Costello movie followed by a horror movie. And it was... Uh, and you get TV out of Bethesda, Maryland? Out of was Bethesda, that? Maryland. Yeah. It was, yeah, WDC Channel 20. Uh, was broadcast out of Bethesda. Dick Dizel played Count Gordival. Yes, yes, and yes. And he was a horror movie A nice host. inside joke for a horror movie house. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, very smart inside joke. And he also did a very early clunky version of what MST3K did later where he would pause a movie and like kind of walk on and comment on – yeah, what that was watching, that like, was taken right from uh, from Zachary in yeah, New York. Yeah, yeah. This is called the time filler. What they're doing, they don't have the two hours. <laughs> so now they're going to. Tu- There's a moment in Phantasm, which is an otherwise great movie, where yeah. he's like, "See how they're taking all this time to tune the guitar? This is we need to fill five minutes. We don't have." <laughs> yeah, in Massachusetts, we had Chiller Theater. It was Saturday nights at eleven thirty, and that showed all the Universal films, and mm-hmm. then that became Creature Double Feature on Saturday afternoons. What was the one that I know that Tim Burton references it in the first? Batman movie when the Joker's hand comes out of the water there was a very famous is that trailer theater where a hand either comes out of the ground or the water at the beginning of it I mean I know it's in Carnival of Souls but I don't think yeah. that that's where who was got. your who was your horror host in Boston we had Feep who was Feep Feep was amazing <laughs> Feep, wasn't Feep a I'm more of a slang term for like 
Someone who's mentally challenged? Possibly. I was too late for Feep. Oh. Uh, but my brothers were into Feep. And Feep <laughs> was an alien who had a head that was the size of like a medicine ball at an old gymnasium. Sure. Like, like his chin was on his sternum. Oh, Okay. And he came out and had a very high pitched, weird voice, and he would introduce movies. And then we got Goulardi syndicated. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So we, we had, um, he we got had, that popular. Yeah. Feep was really crazy. And it would come out and it was just like, he sounded like radio static and like, if you is oh. Island of the Unknown. It's like out of a Chris Cunningham video. Yeah. It was really, really, <laughs> oh really God messed up. Heaven. And then what I love about the internet is somebody made a Feep doll. Oh, well, that's um, sweet. The most handy guide for supernatural doings in the Dream Factory is a book called Hollywood Haunted that when I stumbled upon it a couple of years ago, it's one of those books, I immediately bought like 12 copies and sent them to friends of mine uh, who I know would like it. And it was written by... Lori Jacobson, with the uh, assistance of a, a Hollywood historian, Mark Wanamaker. And we are joined today by the author, Lori Jacobson. How are you, Lori? I am great. What got you interested in writing about <clears throat> ghosts and specifically ghosts in Hollywood, California? Well, I am also a Hollywood historian, along with my partner in this book, Mark Wanamaker, and I covered Hollywood social history, which are, you know, unsolved murder mysteries and uh, people who died tragically before their time. Last month on this very podcast, we reported on the sad fates of both Lionel Atwill and (sighs) Albert Decker. That was heinous. I think it was murdered. I do, too. Oh, I do, too. Yeah. You know, it could have been weird sex gone wrong, which is what they thought it was. Right. Um, Autoerotica asphyxia. But that's solo. Yeah. You know, I'm quite sure there was somebody else in the room. How did a guy write on his own butt in perfectly legible lipstick? While handcuffed and then steal $70,000 in cash from himself. Yes, which, you know, you couldn't prove the cash. And what I discovered is, you know, basically anytime there is a a significant uh, Hollywood murder that goes unsolved, someone paid very large amounts of money to keep it that way from the very earliest days. I mean, you know, before before the contract system ended at studios, when c- celebrities were um, signed to a studio, your studio did that for you. Right. They, they rushed in and protected your reputation because it reflected on them. Right. You could go into, uh, who ran Columbia? Sam Kahn? Oh, uh, uh, uh Cone. You go into his office and go, hey, I killed a hooker. <laughs> and like, All right, hang on. Don't go back to the hotel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty grisly. It really was. But these unsolved murders, uh, there were always ghost stories attached to them. And I would hear them over and over again. And I, I just sort of filed them away as part of Hollywood's lore. Right. And um, and then I actually saw a ghost. And this was at the, the Chinese Theater? Yes, at Grauman's Chinese Theater of Hollywood Heritage, which is a preservation society. And we were going to give a tour of Hollywood's grand movie palaces on Cause, Hollywood Boulevard. Because what people don't understand is that Hollywood Boulevard was once like Broadway, If you went to Hollywood Boulevard in the 30s and 40s, there were far fewer men in lime green thongs rollerblading (laughs) than there are today. Although, you know, it's very odd, but there was um, a man that they called, uh, I think it was Pete the Hermit. I may have his name wrong, but they called him a hermit. And he had a goat, and uh, he was often seen on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, one of, I guess, the first homeless people. Listen, you know, the town just attracted people in droves once um, once it became a motion picture capital. Right. 
And uh, and and these people, you know, very quickly discovered that there was not work for everyone in the movies, and you had to do something. Right, and it does. It, it there's an interesting aspect of it where so many people come to one location to pursue something that is by and large unattainable. So you have a large number of people living with a base level of anger and dissatisfaction. Yes. And, you know, in a lot of beautiful young girls, innocent, coming out to be uh, movie stars. And and they end up at Lionel Atwill's house. Oh, yes. Lionel Atwill, where the piano player was blindfolded and so he could not t- – or blind. No, I think he was blind. They had a blind piano player so he could <laughs> he could never tell what, what went on there. Just get me a blind piano player and a lot of lube. I'll take care <laughs> of the Labor Day weekend. <laughs> oh, my God. I never heard about the lube. If you imagine – Getting when you get off an airplane, there's always that uh, the flight attendant by the door going, "Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye." <laughs> That's what I imagine Lionel Atwell was like the morning after an orgy, as everyone filed out. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the orgy. Thank you, bye bye. Yeah, wow. You're in Grauman's Chinese Theater. Oh yes. I went with about four other very stodgy, boring historians, all male. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like what I'm hearing so far. In the 20s and 30s, if a celebrity wanted to watch his or her own film without the audience knowing that they were present, there was a secret door that led to a special ba- private balcony where they could watch and see how the audience was reacting to oh, their film. And there were even um, panels in the wall, in the lobby, like Sid Grauman after a big premiere, he would want to entertain the celebrities. So he had like a cocktail area and a bar built inside the walls and you would push a buzzer. And this panel would slide back in the lobby, and there was this private, you know, cocktail area where he would entertain. So they're telling us all these unbelievable things. I'm like, I'm just entranced. And we go into the main auditorium. And so she turned to us and said, would any of you like to go on stage behind the movie screen and see what that was like? And I looked around in the back and it was nothing, you know, there was nothing there. I thought maybe I'd find something exciting, but, you know, it was like boxes of light bulbs and toilet paper. So I came out from behind the screen and I, you know, climbed down that awkward ladder. And as I'm walking to this little group of people, the guide says, out of the blue, this place is so haunted. And without another word, the stodgy historians and I turned around and looked at the stage. An unseen figure standing on the stage grasped the ceiling to floor velvet drape. We could see the the handprints in the drape, you know. We could see something grabbing the drape in two places, and it shook very angrily. I got a lot of anger. And then I set a new land speed record (laughs) running for the lobby. And, you know, I went over it and over it again. You know, why did I run? Why did I run? But really, I felt anger. I felt such strong anger. So, uh, the, the lady, the guide, um, tells us, uh, that when she started working there, um, she kept hearing a buzzer and she thought it was the phone, but it was the buzzer inside the cocktail area in the walls. Ah, 
and no one could go in there. Those have long been sealed off. A young lady at the ticket booth told me, she said, oh, you're talking about Fritz. That's Fritz. Fritz used to work here. And I said, when? And she called upstairs and she asked about Fritz and they said, don't talk about Fritz. When my book came out, I was giving a a talk at a bookstore and this woman came up to me afterwards and she came over afterward and said, I used to work at the Chinese and I know about Fritz. What do you know? And she said, he hung himself behind the movie screen. When you pick a public place to make Uh, to end your life, you know, you're making some kind of statement and it was his place, his spot. And he really let me know that he didn't appreciate me going back there. I think the statement you're making is, that's all, folks. One of my guests today is the personification of what I love about living in Los Angeles. And the other guest is just a dude. If you drive through Burbank, California, you may see on a particular street a house that looks just like every other house on the street, a beautiful mid-century ranch in a sea of similar beautiful mid-century ranch homes. But inside that home is King Kong, the alien queen from Aliens, the flying saucer from The Day the Earth Stood Still, the creature from the Black Lagoon, an American werewolf in London. Mr. Bob Burns has been archiving and collecting memorabilia from horror and science fiction movies for the better part of his life, in addition to being a very talented actor and writer. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Mr. Bob Burns. This is the sound of my voice coming now. There you go. Yes. Bob recently had a documentary made about him and his lovely wife, Kathy, made by a very talented filmmaker and a very good friend of mine, Mr. Frank Dietz. This is the sound of my voice. That's all we have time for today. Hey, it's a pleasure. It was great. Um, Pleasure seeing you. Now, Bob. Yes. When did you start aggressively, I would call it, because it isn't collecting, it's archiving, because... This is history that no one is archiving except you and that Microsoft dude in Seattle. When did you start aggressively collecting this stuff? Well, actually, around when I was 13 years old. Uh, The reason being, uh, I knew Ellis Berman, who was a a prop maker uh, for Universal. Well, he did a lot of other places. You grew up in Los Angeles. I, I did. I grew up in Burbank, as a matter of fact. And his studio, I went to school with his son. So I would go over in his house, or the house is a building like a Quonset hut. I'd go over and I met Ellis over there. And of course, I know I bugged him to death. And this is in the late 40s, early 50s? Uh, or? Yeah, 1945. And then 1948, they did a movie called Unknown Island. And they had full-size dinosaurs, guys in suits. And I got to go out to Palmdale when it was 120 degrees and watch these guys fall over and die. Right. I watched that not – I watched that only recently on Sven Gulli on MeTV. Ellis gave you really the first prop. Yeah, but that's what I was getting to. Yeah. Don't rush me. All right. I'm going to (laughs) say don't rush me. And what was the first prop? First prop, he said, prompted, was the – from the Wolfman, the Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman. Of course. There's a cane that's prominently in the film that he buys, and it's a silver head of a werewolf on it, or a wolf, but has, and it has the five-pointed star and all that. Well, it's made out of silver. And, of course, at the end of it, his father kills him by beating the werewolf to death with that. But Ellis made that, and he had it just sitting on a shelf. And every time I went over, I, I loved That's one of my favorite movies. The wolf as is mine. And I picked it up and one day he says, You really like that? And I said, Oh, it's from one of my very favorite movies in the world. He says, Take it. I just kept it as a souvenir. That started my collection when I was thirteen years old. When I was a kid, I wanted to be the wolf man. Because the wolf man would walk around during the day and he right. was just a nice guy and everybody was terrific. But then at night, yes, yes. he would go out and cause all of this havoc and oh, horror boy. and destruction. And he would wake up the next day, would have no memory of it. He right. would, I'm sorry. I wanted to be an alcoholic. <laughs> yes. I remember after I saw Abbott and Costello and Lee Frankenstein for the first time, I remember sure. going into the bathroom and looking in the mirror and trying to change into the Wolfman. Sure. 
kids, not to get too arty farty about it, but you know, the wolf man is ego and id. And I think right. the kids really relate to that. And especially oh. their little kids aren't in full control of their yeah. bodies and their emotions. And well, it's sympathetic think, too. Yeah. And he's very he's sympathetic. sympathetic creature, character, yeah. yeah. My favorite two sort of gaffes in the original wolf man are the main one, which is when he first transforms into the wolf man, he's wearing a wife beater and some light colored pants mm-hmm. and then when he is out he's in a dark colored shirt and dark colored pants right. so i like that the wolf man changed and then the fact that it's claude rains who is the most british human being on oh. the face of the earth yeah. and his son is the, the most american thing you, it's like an eagle <laughs> shitting an apple pie it could not have been <laughs> hello son <laughs> hiya pop yeah so you have – this is the interesting thing. Mm-hmm. If you listening, you watch the original Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. from 1941. You see the right. cane right. that his father kills him with. That's in your house. It's in my house. The King Kong of your collection yes. is King Kong. It is King Kong. When yeah. people watch the original King Kong made in mm-hmm. 1933, right. it's an 18-inch, what we would call an armature. Right. Metal puppet, I guess you right. could call it. Yeah. You own it. Yes, I, at a party, introduced King Kong to Homer Simpson. That might be my <laughs> single greatest achievement. <laughs> and to hold it is surreal. Mm-hmm. To have it in your hand. It makes yeah. it real because that thing is heavy. It is heavy. Yeah. yeah. Now, how did, you, how did you come into possession I of, came uh, into of possession the King Kong? A friend of mine, Phil Kellison, he was a puppet guy, he used to, and he worked at a place called Cascade, which is a commercial house. But anyway, so he was Paramount, not Paramount, yeah, Paramount now, was Paramount, uh-huh. had a bunch of parts left over of all kinds of dinosaurs, whatever, and so they just bought them all to save them from having to make, because that's the hardest part of an armature is having to make it and mill it and do that right. kind of stuff on it. Yeah. And in one box, it just says gorilla. That's all it said on it. And he opened it up and crying out loud, it was Kong, but it was rotting away. It smelled like burnt automobile tires. It was really bad. And even the skeleton still looks like King Kong. I mean, the face, you look at yeah, the face. Yeah, in Paramount Studios, in some room, mm-hmm. there's a box yep. labeled gorilla. Right. And there's just this thing in it that somebody would look at and chuck. Right. Exactly. And it's, If you yeah. didn't know what it was, you'd throw it away. The city is full of that stuff. Oh, boy. And until eBay came along, all the studios yeah. couldn't wait to get rid of it. That's how a lot of my collection came about. The studios couldn't wait to get rid of it. Because it, yeah, they don't want it. Storage truck. They yeah. don't want it. Yeah. It's industrial waste to them yeah, at, at the yeah. time, not yeah. anymore. Yeah. Oh, no. Now back it's, then. it's big bucks. Now you- Here's the amazing thing. People are listening to the story, mm-hmm. and what they wouldn't believe is that you also have a wife. Yes, I do. <laughs> Who lives in this building with you with all yeah. this amazing... I got, her, I got ama- her at one of the auctions, too. <laughs> Frank made a documentary mm-hmm. of Bob and his beautiful wife, Kathy, yeah. called Beast Wishes. And as I described it, it's so heartwarming. It's, it's about these props and things, but it's also about there's a lid for every pot. And yeah. two people, you found the perfect person oh, for you. Oh, did I ever. And... Yeah. Jeez. You embarked on this amazing life that is incredibly unique in one yeah. way and also incredibly standard and stable in yeah. another way. I think the really remarkable thing about the relationship is, is that when they met, she had no idea of Bob's peculiar interests. Right. She didn't know that he was a monster kid, if, if you will, mm. and yet stayed. Yeah. <laughs> That's the amazing part about it. <laughs> I took that hip, hypnotic class one time. It helped a lot. One of my earliest memories was I saved up to get that really, really detailed Wolfman mask that you get in the back of the comic books. I yeah. sent in the, I the sold Don Post. Caesar. Yes, the Don Post one. And I got it in time for Halloween, and I was very excited, and I was going to get some werewolf hands. They also had monster hands. I remember it well. And, I was so close, and my mom said, oh, I'll make you werewolf hands. I know how to do that. I go, oh, great. So then I spent the money on something else. And my mom, meaning well, went to a fabric store, bought brown fur. You can get, like, mm-hmm. brown fur. Took her oven mitts. Cut out the shape on the brown fur. So you wore and, so I had werewolf this, oven mitts. <laughs> well, yeah, I, but I had this really detailed werewolf mask and the most adorable little <laughs> hello, like these little werewolf. Those were like my wolf, cookie yeah. monster puppets for yeah. hands. Yeah, and I remember very specifically saying, "Those aren't wolf man hands." That is so funny you say that. My mother bought you know the masks that was just the featureless face. Yeah. 
bought one of those, painted the nose brown with nail polish, and cut up the collar of her fake fur coat oh. and glued that oh, onto the mask. Nice and that was my her. Wolfman mask, probably when we were about the same age. Again, I'm not putting my mom down. She had. I am putting my mom Okay. Down. But that sounds kind of cool, though. Or did it not look No, good? no, it was wonderful. It was oh, like okay. one of the sweetest things she ever did. Outside I, of giving birth to me. I, I, think that they, I think that they bought a package of movies that included some Universal stuff. But you would get like one Saturday, you would get a good Universal movie. You know, like yeah. a creature. But then they also bought a lot of other of yeah. these just like. And then you got to put up a, a Yangari monster from the deep. Not even that. The Barely monster movies, okay. like like yeah. Journey to the Center of the Earth or Beyond the Sound Barrier. Like, oh, they go beyond the sound barrier and they encounter monsters. Yeah. No, it literally is, unless we get this up to 3Gs, we're not going to. And it's just these awful, these just, what? This is not. One of the reasons I loved Count Floyd on SCTV was they were barely shoehorning in movies that were just not horror movies. Oh, yeah, totally. Goes, yeah, like that a- was kind of scary when the guy died at the end. <laughs> Who bought that? Prickly? Oh, sorry, kids. They're like, they don't really have a horror movie. Yeah. If it doesn't have a monster... Then yeah, I'm not, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a terrible and one. And now with, we can land a D-Day. Yeah. This is not a monster movie. What? There literally Sherlock was... Sherlock Holmes and the Invisible Ray. There literally was, they showed like breaking the sound barrier and there was no... It's like, this is about building a a jet. This yeah. is nothing. There's no monster in this. I think the, one time a guy fighting, dies. The from, fighting CBs. Yeah, but no, like a guy <laughs> dies from asphyxiation at one point. Like, that's not a monster movie. Yeah. There was one they showed called The Vulture with Akeem Tamaroff. And it's a guy. It's the stupidest monster movie where he's wearing. <laughs> This is what I can remember. He's wearing like this huge robe, but it's set in like modern times, like right. in the seventies. But it turns out his whole body is this weird vulture body that he's hiding, <laughs> and he and he's and he barely like it. They just show like these giant vulture feet at one point, but they never show him like. Right. They got it. Kim Terry's like, I'm not wearing that yeah, vulture suit. What are you nuts? So it, shoot around me. It, it it is. It's a shoot around me monster movie. <laughs> but then every now and then we get something like they showed Reptilicus, which is this weird Danish Danish Godzilla. Godzilla movie. Movie <laughs> with a pretty horrifying scene where a dad gets eaten in front of his family. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Up, it was like, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, but, and, but always behind the building. They yes. never show Reptilicus full no, body because it would get no. in the way of the puppeteer. Those are my memories of watching King Kong, watching Village of the Giants, and getting that's where I got my giantess fetish. And I just imprinted <laughs> sexually Joy Harmon holding the guy against her. It was like, well, giant women. I want giant women. And then this other movie called War of the Gargantuas. That's why you want so many Coop paintings. There's so many Coops. Oh, Coop. <laughs> A lot of Richard Corbin. And, yeah. um, War of the Gargantuas was... We were... Talking about oh. one of the gargantuas and, earlier today. And there was a here, this is a great example of your parents trying to make something better and then making it way worse, which is there's the woman is singing, the words get stuck in my throat sure. in the airport lounge. And the brilliantly covered by a punk band called Dump. Dump. Dump covered it, the Pixies covered it, and so did Devo. Yeah. Um, uh, the three, I prefer the Dump cover. Yes. Dump did a great, yeah, on, yeah, on um, with that album with a plea for Dump on it, which right. is one of my favorite songs. So he reaches in and he eats her. And, the, and again, it's not really graphic, but there's this really horrifying moment where he just like spits her clothes out. And they show the clothes like hitting the ground. Yeah. And I was like, oh, a little fiber. And, and my mom was like, she was made of chocolate. That's why <laughs> he ate her. So then I kept thinking, it's a, there's chocolate people that are trying to live among us, but people just want to eat them, which made it even more horrifying. And I feel like her life must have been a nightmare. And that was before you saw, of course, chocolate people live among us. <laughs> um, War of the Gargantuas, if you haven't seen it, you really do it's have to amazing. see it. It's also from that period of late 60s Japanese horror films that came out of a studio called Toho. Yep. And they are among the best movies to ever have on at a party with the sound off. They are visually beautiful. Oh, they're, they're, very, they're, they're like shag paintings yes, because they're, of they're the, like the design. Paintings. And they're very bright. They're very, very colorful. The background... War of the Gargantuas, I believe at one point in Japan, called the Frank Battle of the Frankenstein Brothers. That wouldn't uh, surprise because me. Because it was ostensibly a remake, for, a sequel to Frankenstein Conquers the World. Conquers the world. Yeah. Calm down, ladies, take it. <laughs> um, if you also then watch You Only Live Twice, it was shot largely at Toho Studios, oh. and a lot of the bit actors in You Only Live Twice are all the Toho regulars from... Monster Zero, War of the Gargantuas, well, and all that stuff. It's very surreal to see 
I know I'm going to mispronounce the name, but I th- believe it's Shohei Imamura, who was one of Kurosawa's big guy. He played the leader of the Magnificent Seven, and yeah. he played the. But he's also the scientist that has to kill Godzilla by taking the oxygen out of the yeah. water. So he's in a lot of these Toho movies, and he's an amazing actor. Yeah. But at the time, it's like I just I got to work. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I think I got to stay in noodles. I can't. <laughs> I can't um, I can't remember if he's in this movie, but there's a great moment at the beginning of – there's a movie called Destroy All Monsters. Of course. Has the best first act I've ever seen in a movie. You know what the first act is? They're pulling in to Monster I, Island. I a saw shot. it at the theater. So I saw it at the New Art like right. 10 no, years I, ago. No, I saw it – But when it when came I was, out. Or I saw it re-released when I was under 10 years old. Okay. So they're doing this pull-in and, and shot. And Paul F. Tompkins used to do a really funny bit about it. And all I can yes, remember is Paul going, like, please, we must destroy – all the monsters. Yeah, please destroy all my, like, <laughs> like, like he say, he did it in this way, like, you know, America, you're just falling asleep here. We need to wake up and focus. And he had people playing in the audience going, but how, what, how can a normal guy like me, yeah. like, like Jake Johnson would stand up and ask <laughs> <Yeah>. this. Please. <laughs> but they're pulling into a close up of Monster Island and the voiceover is, as everyone knows, the world's <laughs> monsters were placed on Monster Island. That's act one. That's literally the first act is, as we all, we don't need to talk about this. They were all put on this island. And then the, the monsters leave the island yeah. and they, they're cutting to, I think it's Imamura, but I could be wrong, but he's watching footage come all over the world like Rodan is attacking Paris. Paris. Yeah. And, and then they go, Mothra is attacking San Francisco. And then he says, what's wrong with him? Like, I mean, these other monsters are assholes, but Mothra was always pretty cool. And now he's like, he's Tom being Kenny, a dick. Tom Kenny used to have the greatest bit about the easiest way to get Mothra. Just find a 40-story light bulb and screw it in. <laughs> <laughs> that also reminds me of the way they would just come up with stuff in King Kong versus Godzilla, which is just gorgeous. Yeah. It's, oh, man. It's pornographically beautiful. Yeah. They th- just throw this in. Like, they just toss it in as an aside. Godzilla is a reptile, and electricity will kill him. Kong is a mammal, and electricity makes him stronger. Wh- what? <laughs> I'm sorry? They had to level the playing field, so we're just going to come up with something with yeah. physics. By the way, kids, don't electrocute yourself if you've got a big fight coming up. <laughs> Remember how we turned Ted Bundy into a Superman when we <laughs> put him in the electric chair and... You could see the, we've got five minutes in the writer's room. What do you guys got? Yeah. It makes one strong. Great. Let's shoot it. Yeah, just do it. That's fine. Got it. Doesn't matter. When you go down the history of, I'll call it L.A. spookitude, um, (laughs) there are certain things, there are certain geographical locations that just scream out this is not cool something happened here 39th and norton where the black dahlia was found uh is one of them that when even when you go there at two o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny day and now it's a nice residential neighborhood if you know what happened there you get a vibe there's a creepy vibe to it um and this one i is is uh is very interesting to me because i used to live right near it Tell us of the Hollymont haunting. Ah, uh, Hollymont um, is uh, in the Beechwood Canyon area. A parapsychologist named Barry Taff, and uh, he worked on the Entity case. If you recall that film, and um, there was a film for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, there was a film called The Entity about a haunting. And it was based on this actual occurrence. Yes. And uh, Barry has investigated literally thousands of cases. And the Hollymount House is his most outrageous case. Um, When he investigated it in, I believe, the 70s, uh, I mean, he saw things. I mean, if I just name them, you, you would think I'm nuts. But... Um, he, he walked into a house and into the house and someone, they were all there to see the ghost, which was out of control at that time. Every, I mean, books were flying off of shelves. 
um, spontaneous fires broke out in, in waste baskets. Um, someone said they were hungry and uh, a bunch of bananas flew from the kitchen uh, into the living room and landed at that person's feet. Um, a, a guy working in the kitchen had started to chop up a head of lettuce with a butcher knife and the head of lettuce with the butcher knife in it rose up off the kitchen counter and chased him out of the house. They had news people come to film this stuff and um, every time they plugged in, the, they, they would unplug a lamp that was working, but if they plugged their equipment into that plug, it would selectively not work. Um, a... Uh, you know, one of those giant dictionaries that you see in a uh, library that weigh maybe 100, 200 pounds. That flew off of a shelf and opened and flapped like a bird to chase the Fox newscaster down a, a Z-shaped stairway. So, in other words, it, it would have been impossible to rig right, right. strings to carry this thing down, you know, and things. And just, this is in the this is in the seventies. This is happening. Yes, and it, it was like in, insane. And so, Barry, the house was for sale. Needless to say, the guy that lived there was was moving out, and um, Barry stayed there several nights uh, by himself. Right. And was quite sure that it was a woman. Um, he smelled perfume. Uh, when he was in bed at night, uh, he felt a woman climb into bed with him and spoon him. We've all had that happen, though, Lori. You know, <laughs> it's like we said, it, Hollywood was crazy. <laughs> But, you know, so so he discovers that the neighbor next door, whose house is almost identical, was having many of the same occurrences. And uh, music was coming out of his walls and chandeliers were swinging. And there were tunnels under that house. And in one of these tunnels, they found the grave of a woman. And the grave was marked simply by her first name and a year. And it was the year prior to the house being built. Now, just to set a little uh, uh, mental image, um, Beechwood Canyon, which, again, I, I knew of this haunting because I lived right around the corner on Beechwood for years is the road that leads up to the Hollywood sign. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, funky little neighborhood just north of, of Hollywood. Uh, immediately north, like not L.A. north, you can walk down to Hollywood from Beachwood. And there are these old houses up there built in the, in the teens and the 20s, very elaborate, beautiful homes, and a lot of stone walls and things. And so in between these two homes, they discovered a set of tunnels. Is that yeah. correct? <clears throat> yes. And where in the tunnel, is the tunnel still open and how do you see the grave? Well, um, you could see it then, but there's been a lot of uh, water erosion. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know, the tunnel is near collapse and most, you know, they, they don't want to go in there. The house is being worked on very heavily now. But um, Barry is convinced that there's uh, water running under underneath the property that's uh -huh. eroding, eroding it. So, you know, so it, it's, it would be extremely dangerous to go in there if it's if it hasn't collapsed already. I see. So these aren't just open to the public where you can just stroll in. Oh God, no, right. no. And they, you know, m many of them were there. There are tunnels. There were a lot of tunnels in the hills, and it was they were they happened during prohibition, when, when that's where people hid their booze. Right. 
However, this is a very odd place for for people to hide their booze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. There are a lot of tunnels under Hollywood. I know that I believe it's what is what is now at Hollywood Center Studios used to be offices of RKO Studios. Um, that Howard Hughes had tunnels built under the studios so he could get Terry Moore. Uh, in and out of the studio without people seeing her, like it was, it was, it was just tunnels for booze and girls. Really? Because I was just with Terry Moore last week. How I would have loved to have asked her about that. She famously dated Howard Hughes. Yeah, that I know, but yeah. I didn't know about sneaking her out of the tunnels. Well, that's the rumor I'm starting. Now, when did you meet Kathy? Gee whiz. This is our 59th wedding life? anniversary you... is coming up now. Oh, congrats. Happy anniversary. I don't know. She's one of a kind. I mean, literally. She's not crazy like I am. She doesn't love the stuff like I do. I mean, I right. don't lick it or anything anymore. I did when I first <laughs> got it, I finally quit that, you know. What are you doing? I'm licking Kong. That's it. I'll yeah. be right up. She, but she appreciates it and knows what it is. I mean, she knows this stuff is history, for one thing. Yeah. She loves the way it was manufactured and made. And that's what I do. I love to show it to people and say... Here it is. You were in the Army. Did you meet her before you went into the Army? Yes, in typing class. They took me out for the Army yelling and screaming. I had just finished working with Paul Blaisdell, who was my idol and mentor and everything else you can, I can right. possibly say about the guy, on It, the Terror from Beyond Space. It? It. it. Terror from Beyond Space. Yes. Rent it, download it, stream it, watch it. Yes. The, oh, it's the, wonderful. The It in question, yeah. built by you and Paul Blaisdell. Oh, Paul. I didn't build it. He and Jack. But you're there. I was just, I glued the stuff back on when Ray Corrigan would trip and fall or something. Right. That's about you're it. being modest. Is he an Invasion of the Saucerman? He and I are in close-ups. All the Saucer Man close-up heads are us, yeah. That's fantastic. We only use the Saucer Man for three days, and they were little people, and uh, those heads were pretty heavy and because there were <laughs> fiberglass inside, and you know, they'd, they'd bring their head down, blah, pull it down, and go back. They, they didn't like it very much. They had to find, yeah, they had to find little people to yeah, play the so all the. By the way, if, and if you've never seen Invasion oh, of the Saucer it's, it's Man. It's an incredible uh, little film. It is an incredible little film, and it is also the epitome of the mid-century 1950s oh. uh, invasion, alien invasion movie. Oh, definitely. B, alien invasion movie. The Red Not, Scare, all that stuff. Yeah, that all, 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 of that, yeah. all of that stuff. Um, yeah. And actually, for a cheap horror movie, has some pretty scary it stuff in it. It has some very scary all things stuff. Considered, that, that, the needles. There's one scene where a saucer man guy gets mm -hmm. gored in the eye by this bull, and the blood comes gushing out. Chocolate syrup, I should say. No, well, the only way we got away with that at all is it was not a human being. Oh, otherwise you it would have been a human being. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, now anything goes. You know? Yeah. But still, and, I think, and we had these alcoholic fingered and na these needles that came out of the saucer man's hands and they'd hit you and they'd, and they'd make you drunk if you weren't drunk. If you were drunk, it would kill you from alcoholic <laughs> poisoning. So, I mean, there's some shots in there. Uh, one of the saucer man's hands gets cut off. His hand yeah. is crawling around by itself, like, uh, you know, beast with five fingers right. and punctures the tire and climbs in the car and all that kind of stuff. Had a lot of stuff. The whole film was shot in seven days, of course. That's fantastic. And made for the drive-in. Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, of course. I was home recently, this apropos of nothing, sitting at the kitchen table with my dad. There's an Us magazine on the kitchen table showing a picture of a little person that had recently married a full-size woman. Mm -hmm. And my father, without even thinking, just looks at the photo and goes, look at this asshole. Toe-to-toe -to -toe is noses in it, and nose-to-nose -nose is toeses in it. <laughs> So you uh, are in the Army, and you had a very interesting job in the Army. You made victims. Yes. There was a thing called Operation Blow-Up that they did out in the desert in Texas. It's bodies, it's guys that are wounded, gut wounds, arms off, and these doctors, new doctors, going to be doctors, right. had to go out and treat them. Well, the way they were always done, just had a tag on them saying, this man has his arms gone, he's tied right. on the arm. Well, it doesn't look too good. In Canada, they started a thing called simulated casualty, where they would make pieces like a gut wound, glue it on uh -huh. the guy. They were pretty bad, but they did it. And it really worked out well. And so they said, well, since you have a background in makeup, can you do that? Here, we'll do it. So we did. We made up our own pieces and stuff. And we always knew it worked 
for two reasons. One thing, the new doctor to be would puke all over the place. <laughs> One guy fainted dead away because we had it as realistic as possible. I had a, a little ear syringe full of blood, and I had a deal, and it would squirt blood like if an artery was cut, something mm-hmm. like that. And again, because people weren't <clears throat> inoculated to oh, those no. kind of visuals back yeah. then in the way now. It's like, oh, the eh. Freddy movies and all that yeah, stuff right. and Saw and all that. I mean, everybody. But those days, no, nobody saw that at all. You know? Well, that was the thing, too, is that what you really wanted those doctors, these young doctors, to yeah. get a chance to puke and a- pass out a- here in Austin, right. Texas, as opposed to yeah, in the war zone. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. People about my age and a little younger, maybe, we had like 50 of us, and I'd train them all, and we'd go out and get these guys laying all over the place. It was cool. It was really, really cool. You got this job because they saw that you liked monsters? Yes. Yes. From what my brother, I had two brothers that were in the army, and yeah. from what they would say, is like, oh, you're very good at makeup. Well, you should go to sniper school. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. see if there's anybody in sniper school that wants to learn how to do makeup. Explain to the uninitiated mm-hmm. what a monster kid is. You know, I'm not even sure what a monster kid is. I mean, I've been asked that before. Uh, to me, it's uh, it's somebody that, that likes monsters, of uh-huh. course, and things, movies or, or whatever. It could be comic book, could be anything. You know? Right. They haven't overtaken you or anything like that. You just like that. You love it. You love to sketch them if you can or whatever. I have stolen this from Matt Weinhold. <laughs> but uh, as I always say to people, it's my football. Yes, you know, absolutely. It's like there's a certain group of kids and it, you have an affection for this sort of thing. Right. And yeah. it sustains you throughout your life. Oh, it does. Everybody has – now I think I'm uh, quoting St- Stevie Wonder or Sliza. <laughs> Everybody has a thing. <laughs> right. And it's what you're into. And like Kirk Hammett from Metallica. Oh, sure. Who's yeah. – a rock star. Yeah. And is a ginormous monster oh, kid. Yeah. Steven, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. Hugh Hefner yes. is a huge monster kid. Really? Yeah. yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. Yes. A lot of us, I think, also came from that era during the horror boom of the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Right. When uh, right. Shock Theater was a package of universal monster movies that were basically sold to syndicated networks right. and they Love started it. showing them on television and that's where all of a sudden kids were discovering oh. the monster movies that had come out in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of these famous icon iconographic monsters, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, they were all made in the 1930s, 1940s. Right. And they were just movies that came out and then they went away and they didn't really become embedded onto our national pop culture until the 50s. That's right. When television first came on and they were starving for programming. Right. Not like now, where it's 7,000 yeah. channels and, and nothing yeah. on, as Bruce Painstein <laughs> right. would say. Yeah, everything's um, gone now. But they said, well, well, what about those old horror movies? We'll release those. And they had a package called Shock Theater. And right. it was from Shock Theater that the idea of a spooky host would come on. That's and true. Which, Very uh, true. The, so the sort of thing, it didn't happen until 20 years after most of these movies were made, which mm-hmm. is, is that interesting. Is right, that was basically the seed yeah. <laughs> for a lot of us who were not into sports Mm-mm. or not oh, into no. yeah. race cars or whatever else. Yeah. It seems to me that monster kids break off into two groups. They either go into writing or acting mm-hmm. so they can create that stuff on their own. True. Or they go into music mm-hmm. because especially metal for some reason – and I don't know why, and I think it's because, yeah. you know, heavy metal is just monsters that get laid. Like Kirk Hammett and uh, my friend uh, Piggy Demon, who is uh, Rob Zombie's bassist, these are all monster kids. Yeah. They love the same stuff. Some go into music and get girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, they just do it different. Yeah. yeah. I was introduced to Alice Cooper once, and I presented him with one of my uh, monster sketchbooks. And he's sitting there, and he's looking through it, and he's really digging it. And then he turns to me, and he goes, I know you. And I'm like, right away, I'm like... Wow, you know me? Like, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm so excited. And he goes, yeah. He goes, you were the kid in elementary school who was drawing monsters on your desk <laughs> while the teacher was talking. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, that's exactly right. And he goes, yeah, you know why? I was that kid also. Sure. You know, yeah. and there it was. I was listening to Tim Burton being interviewed, and he was talking about how his daughter's favorite movie was War of the Gargantuas. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that, well, obviously for Tim Burton, but like some people like go like, what? Like to some people, War of the Gargantuas just sounds like a ridiculous movie. And then yeah. for other people, it's like, yes, the Beatles. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know?
there's a class of people that if you know who Forrest Ackerman is, you know what war gargantuas yeah. means to people. And I remember there's a genuine, especially if you're a little kid, there's a genuine moment of, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming where she falls off the cliff and suddenly there's this good orange gargantua there. Yeah. And they do this whole backstory They're about brothers. these two brothers. And they, it was like, what the, this just turned into, I t- it I, was amazing. That's Wow. I, I talked to Russ Tamblin about War of the Gargantuas. That's right. He's in it. When I sold him my fax machine through the recycler. <laughs> and that's not a lie. Well, that's, that's by the way, that's my Twitter background is War of the Gargantuas. That was a weird shot. I remember that very specifically because he's coming out of the ocean near an airport, but he looks like he's rising from an elevator. <laughs> like he's not <laughs> yeah. stomping out of the ocean. He's, and then, <clears throat> although even that, it's clearly a miniature. But there's a scene where and he you goes, can tell the miniature, you can tell the scale of the miniatures in those movies because the one thing you can't shrink is the size of water droplets. No, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. But there's a very surreal shot when he's done doing what he's doing at the airport, and then he runs and jumps back in the ocean. There is something so unnerving about it's this <laughs> yeah. thing, and he's stomping and running away, and then just jumps. And he's this just place. pure evil. I mean, he's yeah. he is the Joker. He, he he's is, just yeah. all about anarchy and. <clears throat> Oh, it's so weird. My favorite title of horror movies in the realm of Destroy All Monsters was Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Mm-hmm. And I like that they didn't assume they were going to fight. Right. <laughs> Let's have a meet. They're going to have a nice lunch. We're going to see what happens. Yeah, and that's another movie where the first 45 minutes is really well written, and then it just goes into the shitter. It's and this the, really cool movie. The, the first 45 minutes is the hero is trying to find a way to die. Yeah. It's really dark. Well, they all – all those Universal movies, all their monsters, all of them, even Dracula to some extent, it's like the monster's going, I'm doing the best I can with this <laughs> shitty hand I've been dealt. They're, they're not – No, they're never going after people. People start bothering them. They're yeah. not asking, and they don't have any diabolical plan. Yeah, Lawrence Talbot wants to die. Yep. Dracula's like, I have to drink blood, or yeah. I, what the fuck am I yeah. going to do? Frankenstein Fra- was very happy dead. Frankenstein is a very hard movie for me to rewatch after I had became a dad because you realize he's just this little baby yes. with the strength to kill people, but if people would just be nice to him, he wouldn't yes. hurt people. And, 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 and it, So weirdly, that movie affected me because – from becoming a dad. We were talking earlier today with Bob Burns, who's, as Bob would say, and you'll hear him say, or already, or just heard him say, Glenn Strange, who played the Frankenstein monster Mm -hmm. in the later Universal films, was like his adopted father. Oh, wow. Uh, They were beyond friendship close. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Strange portrayed the Frankenstein monster as what you think of as the Frankenstein monster, this lumbering. But Boris Karloff... It's heartbreaking. And when he's in the windmill and it catches on fire, he goes like, "Ah, ah." he's whimpering. It's It's, awful. It's awful. uh, It's awful. You're basically watching a Franz Kafka story. Yeah. It's, he doesn't know. He, wait a minute. What is going on? Why am I in this world? Why is everyone angry at me? I haven't done anything. He drowns the girl because they're throwing flowers in the lake and they're floating and he runs out of flowers. So he just looks at her and goes, I'll throw you. Frankenstein is a really amazing movie. Bella Lugosi's Dracula, the first 11 minutes is great, and then it's turgid. Oh, it, it is a filmed play. Yeah, it's a it, filmed play. And it's then, really and a, turgid. And a, by a bored man. A, a play filmed by a bored yeah, man. Yeah, that doesn't want to be doing <laughs> it. doesn't it, want no. to be doing it. Well, it's really weird, too, because you see the first 11 minutes of, of the Bella Lugosi Dracula, weirdly enough, is also you see the beginnings, all the basics for cheap haunted house horror movie almost TV host stuff is in the, where they pan over and there's yep. a skull and then there's an armadillo for no reason. And then yes, they, that's they just, one of my favorite things. <laughs> no, like, is there's an armadillo in the middle of Czechoslovakia <laughs> or Hungary, wherever they are. <laughs> yeah. And then the movie's terrible. And then there's one shot out of nowhere where the camera pans down to the floor and Renfield is crawling towards yeah. the camera. And it's this, Wow, and then goes right back to camera bolted down. People walk in. Yeah. Hello, yeah. And what? Oh, Dwight God. Fry gives the best performance Phew. in that movie. Oh God, is he amazing? Frankenstein in the amazing movie, and the Bride of Frankenstein for completely different reasons. Oh man, is, that is movie an amazing, amazing. movie. Yeah. It's, Bride of Frankenstein is almost like a David Lynch movie. It's yes. just so subtly 
insane. Yeah, and it's all implied yeah, disturbing it's really stuff. Whacked. Like the stuff that Dr. Praetorius what he basically wants to do to the world. Yeah. All gods and monsters. Like yeah. he's just gonna And there's some creepy shit in there, uh played by uh, Ernest Thessinger. Oh who boy. Was, who made Paul Lynn look like Sterling <laughs> Hayden. Um <laughs> <laughs> and well, at one point, they're digging up a corpse, and he just goes, again, Dwight Fry, only 19. And he goes, I hope her bones are firm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like Morrissey, if Morrissey made he, horror movies in the 30s. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, so much goth stuff comes from that, down here among the dead men, having mm-hmm. some wine. And, and, and f- do you know the name of the best-selling book that Ernest Thessinger wrote? No. Adventures in Needlepoint? <laughs> Not a lie. <laughs> So hang on. So Ernest Thessinger For and- some reason, Clive Barker knew a lot about him, and I don't know what? why. <laughs> <laughs> so the two best-selling needlepoint books were written by Ernest Ro- Thessinger and, and Rosie, Rosie Greer. Greer. <laughs> Those two. And we've never seen them together at the same mm. time. I remember probably the white trashiest thing I ever did. And oh, I, let me hear it. And I grew up in some yeah. less... I did not grow up in... Tony surroundings. <laughs> My mom, who I am very grateful to, introduced me to all of these movies. Oh, no kidding. And loved them as a child. She loved them as a child. And I loved them. And she really let me love them and would stay up with me. I know I was nine. Mm-hmm. And she stayed up with me to watch Dracula with Bela Lugosi. And wow. it was only 1130 Whoa. Uh, during the summer. And she just, in retrospect, she was probably hammered. <laughs> but I remember watching probably Dracula with my mom, 1973, cooking hot dogs on the gas flame of our stove as if they were on a campfire, hot dogs on a fork, over a gas stove, not go. safe or healthy. Nope. But that's what we did, and I do remember that entire summer. And Creature from the Black Lagoon, which also is just the pillars of that type of movie, are riveted down. By the way, Creature from the Black Lagoon basically beat for story beat a remake of King Kong. And Creature from the Black Lagoon also is basically is a Jaws is a almost beat for beat remake of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yes, the same three types on the boat going down in the cage. The only thing that's missing is Julie Adams. Yes. There's no there's no love interest. And there is a sound effect from the creature from the Black Lagoon in it, I believe. That yeah. shows that he uses the creature's roar at the end of Duel when the truck dies and the end of Jaws when yeah, it's the, same the shark thing. dies. It's the same. It's the creature's roar. And God, that movie. My, my wife and I, I bonded over that. I was going to say, God, DVD, uh, alter, alternate tracks. <laughs> 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 and the famous creature from the Black Lagoon theme. Bah, 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 yeah. bah, Written by Henry Mancini. What? Hank Mank. Well, that that was ripped off on different variations on like Star Trek episodes and all It's that. in King Kong vs. Godzilla. They just took the soundtrack because no they, didn't, shit. they didn't like the Japanese soundtrack. So they just used, because it was Universal International. So they had access to their oh. library. So if you watch King Kong vs. Godzilla, which I know you will be, <laughs> when Godzilla comes, they play the creature theme. <laughs> bah, bah, bah. No kidding. Yeah. I didn't know till a few years ago that all the music in Night of the Living Dead is public domain archive music from 50s horror movies. Yes. So uh, I was watching, I think, Teenagers in Space, and I'm like, this is the Night of the Living Dead thing. And then I was like, oh, they just use yeah, all I've, public I've heard domain stuff. The Plan 9 from Outer Space, which is not a comparative in terms of quality, right. but all that was library music. Yeah. And you can hear a lot of that music coming up in other things. Is the Hollymont haunting, it's the same haunting, and it extends to two houses? The grave is under one house. Most of the activity was in the house next door. And these, and these houses are referred to as Jolly's house and Gray's house? Dexter Gray's house was where the grave was found, and Don Jolly's house. That is where the real physical activity was taking place. You know, like chairs would slide across a room and pin people to a wall. The spirit, she she didn't like women, I don't believe. And 
And um, she, you know, she pinned a woman to a wall with a chair or a chair scooted across the room and pinned a woman to a wall and held her there while she was screaming for help. And then a kettle from the stove flew through the air and went over to the woman and poured water all over her. Uh-huh. Yeah, call her Regina because that is the name on the grave. It's All it said on the grave was Regina 1922. So, you know, Florida. Flash forward a few decades, and I was able to visit the house probably about seven years ago with Barry and a group of ghost hunters. There were all these guys, and they had all these instruments, you know, to measure this and measure that, and they're running or through the house and around the house and outside, and I just thought that was all a bunch of crap. And I went upstairs, and the moment I began climbing the stairs, I felt the presence of a spirit. And Barry is the one who uh, taught me to do that. And basically, we can all do that. You might notice that you have a headache if you're standing in one particular room, but if you step out into the hallway, you no longer have a headache. Or you might feel cold in one particular spot in a room and three feet over, you don't feel cold. Let me ask you a question about that. Sure. Because this is actually the only quasi-supernatural experience I've had. You know, for years and years and years and years, I lived in um, Roddy McDowell's old house. Ooh. And I was in that house one night during the remodel, no electricity on in the house, full moon, massive remodel, so plastic tarps are moving. And I did not have the creepiest vibe. Wherever Roddy went, he's... (laughs) happy and <laughs> there is not uh, there is not a molecule of spookiness to that house i'm not someone prone to creating a a vibe where the environment would make it possible before it was remodeled by la unified school district i was in the basement of the ambassador hotel where robert kennedy was famously assassinated in june of 1968 in the kitchen. In the kitchen. Right. We are walking from through the through the pantry into the coconut grove, which was the uh, the ballroom where he held his last. I guess it was his campaign rally, and yes. then he was leaving through the pantry to uh, to leave the hotel or to go back up to his suite, and that's where Sirhan Sirhan assassinated him. Walking through there with a guide, and. I walked through a blast <clears throat> of freezing air. And I comment later, why, if no one is down there, is the air conditioning still on? Because it really felt like you just walked past an air conditioning vent that was just like an industrial air conditioner that was just blowing. Wow. And they said, no, there's, a, there's nothing down here. There's no power down here. Mm. So what is that? Is that, a, is that a common manifestation of something from beyond our realm of normal experience what is the what is the cold spot a cold spot is is a typical symptom of uh, of a spiritual presence or a ghost and why they make the temperature drop where they are i i don't know it could be it doesn't and and i'm not saying it was robert kennedy but it could be somebody who was there who later died peacefully at home in their sleep and somehow in their in their post life uh have in some way returned to this uh place of of deep trauma or that there's just an energy from the the deed that uh that happened i you know i can imagine what it must be like going through Belsen or, you know, or any of the uh, Nazi camps. I mean, there must be such psychic, there's a psychic disturbance to those areas. It unsettles the natural order of things. Yes, especially when you have something that enormous. Uh, Same thing with battlefields. Um, And sometimes it's just the energy that uh, repeats and repeats. People still hear gunfire and cannon fire on, 
uh, on battlefields. And, and it doesn't mean that these poor souls are s- stuck in that scene to be played over and over again. It's just that the energy of those enormously tragic yeah. events, yeah, can change. I imagine that whoever inherits the Playboy Mansion from Hugh Hefner in a hundred <laughs> years, when they walk by the grotto, they'll still be able to hear Jimmy Kahn moaning. When we were working together on The Love Bug, which was later <laughs> renamed Angels in America. No! <laughs> But The Love Bug, directed by Peyton Reed, who Ah, directed Ant-Man, which has many homages to them in it. Oh, wow. So we are on set, and he's telling me that when Bruce was telling me that when he was on Briscoe County Jr., they're on the Fox lot, Mm -hmm. and there was this uh, guy that shoveled up horse shit because they had horses. And he would say, I've been on this lot. You know, it's horse shit to you guys. It's college education to my kids. (laughs) And Bruce, who's an incredibly great guy and and very much a working class guy, befriended this guy and he would talk. And and one day this guy just goes, yeah, I was uh, uh, right over there is where I I threw Guy Williams into a stack of boxes. And um, Mm -hmm. Bruce goes, I'm sorry? He goes, yeah, Guy Williams on Lost in Space. I picked him up and threw him into a stack of boxes. And he says, well, what did you play on Lost in Space? And he goes, played a goon. <laughs> and so so Bruce kind of gleaned some more information about him and then went back and, and, um, and, and got a VHS cassette of the episode and had everybody in the crew sit down during lunch and he's like, I want to show you something. And he yeah. put it on and he goes, you know, that's Russ. And, and then when he gave, and the, the, what amazes me is that the thing that really waylaid the guy was that Bruce let him keep the cassette. Oh, I can no keep it. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It must have been gold for him. I get so much pleasure from stories like that. Yeah. Bob's documentary about Bob and Kathy called Beast Wishes. But you're an illustrator. You're an actor and an illustrator. You worked for Disney. How did you? One of the uh, best illustrators, I might oh, say. Oh, thank you. That's Without a kind. doubt. Very kind of you, Bob. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you later. Thank you. <laughs> um, I saw Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein when I was six years old. Changed my life, without a doubt. And every single thing that I do. You're telling me you saw Dracula. <laughs> I'm telling you. what I saw when I saw it. Yeah. And everything that I've done as an actor, as a screenwriter, as an animator, I can indirectly trace back to that very first viewing of that movie because it has all of those things in it, including an animated opening sequence, which they no one's been able to figure out who did it. But and it's funny, I will say, as a parent, it's very, very hard to get kids to watch anything black and white. Yep, sure is. Although my kids loved the Ferguson riots. No. Um, <laughs> and a sense of humor and what makes a kid laugh is so, that's indefinable. Well, interestingly, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein is a great portal for kids to discover old movies that right. they normally might not watch. That's not only dead on, mm-hmm. but also it is one of those few movies like I made my kids watch it and they loved it. Like you can tell when kids are laughing oh, yeah. fake and when they're laughing sincerely. When I was younger, I got to meet Glenn Strange, who became like my father. Now, for uh, those of you who don't know Glenn yeah, Strange... Glenn, Glenn is... Well, he played the Frankenstein monster in three films. He played House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. And a lot of times when people are looking at a drawing or a painting or a photo of what they envision as the classic Frankenstein... It's, it's Glenn. Usually not Boris Karloff, it's, it's Glenn it's Strange. Glenn. Yeah. yeah, even in Boris And he was Karloff. the bartender on Gunsmoke. And yeah, for, until he couldn't work anymore. So I was lucky there that I already met somebody. I mean, I, I met him because I'm, I'm a big Western fanatic, too. I mm-hmm. love Westerns and stuff. And he just became like a father to me. Only we didn't really talk about monsters that much in those days. We mainly talked about Westerns and stuff. I mean, Well, yeah. Know. It's the thing that brings you together, and then you just yeah. live your life and like a normal... You live your life like a normal person from there. And yeah. he appeared in... He at least came yeah. to yes. one of your rather infamous Halloween shows. Yeah, he did. Right. Yeah. 
I had a dummy of him in the living room at that point with a lab set up and the Jacob's Ladder going and all that kind of stuff. And uh, That was an early one. Yes, it was. Right? And he, he came over and stood by it and stayed around and talked to the kids and stuff after it was because he, he's a big man. He was like me. He was very much closer than my dad was. My dad didn't like any stuff I did. He didn't care about anything I did. So, this is know. a common denominator, I oh, think, for though, any yeah. of us. You right? know, well, that, and that's pretty true, too. <laughs> yes. A lot of the guys I know didn't have the best childhood in the world. And it's usually with their dad somehow. With me, it certainly was. Yeah, it's not 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 abuse, but ne- just neglect. Like, I don't understand what you're that's doing. And you're what, on your own. That's more, kind of more what, of what it is. Yeah. Glenn understood everything I said. I mean, we just talked about stuff all the time. And, and he was just, he was the greatest guy ever. I mean, I miss him every single day. I'm watching Gunsmokes now and I cry when I see it. Uh, sure, I can only imagine. all the guys over there. Well, I used to take a week of my vacation every year and go over the Gunsmoke set with Glenn. published his Martian invasion masterpiece, War of the Worlds. In 1938, Orson Welles brought it to radio, inadvertently scaring the hell out of everybody who, spooked and paranoid already by constant news of the war in Europe, thought it was real. In 1896, two years earlier, H.G. Wells published his famous mad scientist turning animals into people novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau. 100 years after its publication, in 1996, New Line Cinema began the third motion picture adaption of that novel. Unlike War of the Worlds, no one thought the story was really happening. But in retrospect, they may have preferred it to the experience they had if they were part of the crew that was making the movie. No one more so than its writer and director, Richard Stanley. But first, some background. H.G. Wells published The Island of Dr. Moreau in 1896, telling the story of Edward Prendick, shipwrecked on an island ruled by the mysterious Dr. Moreau, who, Prendick comes to learn, to his considerable horror, is creating a race of human-animal hybrids in his mad scientist laboratory. Six years after the publication of The Island of Dr. Moreau, Joseph Conrad published his novel, Heart of Darkness. Both books are narrated by an interloping observer. Both books tell the tale of a civilized, intelligent person, Dr. Moreau in the Wells book and Kurtz in Conrad's, who goes off into the jungle where they succumb to megalomania and rule their own unique hellish kingdom. Moreau's, composed of half-human, half-animal experiments, and Kurtz's, the terrified local natives. Both stories are, by and large, cautionary tales of the trappings of civilization and modernity being only that, trappings, and that the heart of a beast beats close to the surface under even the most noble chest. Wells thought Hearts of Darkness a little too close to the island of Dr. Moreau and told Joseph Conrad so, and that did not help their friendship. The Island of Dr. Moreau was the first one to be made into a movie, 1932's Island of Lost Souls, with Charles Lawton traipsing about the jungle in a white linen suit with a bullwhip. The film is super creepy, with a brilliant turn by Bela Lugosi as the half-man, half-animal, sayer of the law. Are we not men? That Are We Not Men speech may sound familiar. It became quite popular later when it was used as the refrain of Devo's first hit, Jocko Homo. (laughs) 
Anyway, Island of Lost Souls is a lot of fun. Made before the Hollywood studios imposed their own censor board, called the Production Code, it's full of sexual innuendo and sadomasochism. Lots of weird angles and spooky photography, all great stuff. The Island of Lost Souls. It was remade in 1977 with Burt Lancaster and Michael York, directed by Don Taylor. The film used Wells' original title, The Island of Dr. Moreau, and that movie is a great example of having a bigger budget, A-list actors, better special effects, more time to shoot, and coming up with an infinitely less effective movie as a result. Hearts of Darkness finally made it to the screen in 1979. Orson Welles had planned to make it in 1940 as his first film under his deal with RKO. But instead, he opted to make a thinly veiled biography of William Randolph Hearst named Citizen Kane. But in 1979, Francis Ford Coppola updated Conrad's book, changing the time and location to the Vietnam War and changing the title to Apocalypse Now. Marlon Brando took on the role of Kurtz. Brando, by that time, had a very bad reputation in Hollywood regarding his, let's say, professionalism. His talent was never the question. It's just that he didn't seem to care about it. Actually, he seemed to hold it in great disdain. Brando promised Francis Ford Coppola he would show up on the set in the Philippines, in shape, on time, and well rehearsed. Guess what he didn't do? In the words of writer-director Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now doesn't just tell Joseph Conrad's story. It forced the filmmakers to live it. When the film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, Coppola said in an interview, We were in the jungle. There were too many of us. We had access to too much money, too much equipment. And little by little, we went insane. Remember that quote? Fade to black. Jump cut. 1990. A young British filmmaker named Richard Stanley has released a post-apocalyptic science fiction film called Hardware. It's very well received, and it leads to a second independent feature, the 1992 supernatural horror film Dust Devil. Richard Stanley was now a hot property in Hollywood and was being primed for a major studio breakthrough. He wrote a script for the film he had always wanted to make, a faithful interpretation of H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau. Stanley had always loved the book, and he really hated the 1977 remake. I saw the Don Taylor version at my local cinema when I was a kid. It has the distinction of being probably the first movie I ever saw, which angered me so much that I wanted my money back. Despite having not optioned Wells' novel, Stanley had written a script and gotten Badlands and Das Boot producer Edward Pressman interested in the project. We thought of it as a modest budget you know, sci-fi film that would be done for five, eight million dollars. But something strange started to happen. The film began to take shape in a form that was, well, let's say, not what nature had intended. New Line Cinema, who was releasing the film, was up to that point famous by and large for the Nightmare on Elm Street films. But it had suddenly scored big with the Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman film Wag the Dog. Flush with money and prestige, New Line began seeing The Island of Dr. Moreau as something other than an $8 million horror film. Michael Hare, the author of the brilliant Vietnam War journal Dispatches, was hired to rewrite the script. Hare had previously written all the narration for Apocalypse Now. And the Moreau script became something bigger, something deeper, something other. That's not always the best thing. Like The Island of Dr. Moreau or Heart of Darkness teaches, when one heads off into the jungle, delusions of grandeur can be your undoing. And the very first thing really came down to who was going to be Dr. Moreau, and um, Ed figured out a way of getting to Marlon Brando. Producer Ed Pressman wanted Marlon Brando. New Line's Mike DeLuca wanted Marlon Brando. DeLuca's boss, Bob Shea, did not. Brando was no longer known as the genius who reinvented screen acting. He was now known as the guy who nearly destroyed Francis Ford Coppola and Apocalypse Now. But the film started to take shape. Brando was lined up to play Dr. Moreau. Bruce Willis was signed to play Pendrick, the innocent castaway. 
and James Woods was going to play Moreau's sidekick, Montgomery. Good? No. Bruce Willis got divorced, couldn't leave the country for legal reasons, and dropped out of the picture. And then, well, I'll let director Richard Stanley tell you. I then made um, another strategic error. Um, I met Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer was a big, big, big star in the mid-1990s. And when he said he wanted to join the film, he joined the film. The budget got bigger. The movie got bigger. And now it was set. Marlon Brando, Val Kilmer, James Woods, The Island of Dr. Moreau, under the direction of Richard Stanley. Right? No. Kilmer decided, after he said yes, that he wished he had said no. So he demanded fewer shooting days. Eventually, they gave him James Woods' role. James Woods, out. Val Kilmer, over there. Replacing Val Kilmer, who, if I recall, was replacing Bruce Willis. Quiz show's Rob Morrow. But he's not in the movie. Wait for it. Off they went to Australia, with a cast of actors playing beast people. Among them, Nelson de la Rosa. At two feet four inches, one of the shortest men in the world. Filming started, and immediately, there was a problem. For whatever reason, Val Kilmer was not happy, and he decided to make Richard Stanley not happy too. By the time Kilmer changed parts and took on this other part of the drug fucked assistant to... uh to Marlon Brando's Dr. Moreau, he was playing up a bit on set. He was just kind of being a bit rude and abrasive. Um, he, that was his character, though, so fair go. Maybe that was the way he prepared to be an arsehole, to, you know, act like one off camera. But nature does not like to be outdone. So, to answer Val Kilmer, it served up a real hurricane. And in one day, enough rain fell to sweep the entire set out to sea. The studio shut down the production and Richard Stanley was fired. Just like that. He had been shooting for three whole days. Actors tried to bolt. Rob Morrow did. Feruza Balk tried, but was chased back by a snarling pack of lawyers. Director John Frankenheimer an old-school safari suit and bullhorn director who had made some amazing films. Birdman of Alcatraz, The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, Grand Prix. John Frankenheimer was brought in to control this runaway train, and he did, although it required stepping on and, in some cases, breaking some toes. If the natural state of the production of The Island of Dr. Moreau was chaos, John Frankenheimer upset that balance by imposing order good old-fashioned U.S. Marine drill sergeant order. But there are some situations in life where order cannot, will not, be imposed. And the island of Dr. Moreau was, apparently, one of them. Enter the real storm. Hurricane Brando. Marlon Brando showed up to play H.G. Wells' Dr. Moreau the same way he showed up to play Joseph Conrad's Kurtz, willfully late, intentionally unprepared, grossly overweight, and decidedly determined, or so it seemed, to undermine the production at every turn. To begin with, Brando insisted, for whatever reason, that his Dr. Moreau wear whiteface. He spoke in a strange, inexplicable lisp, and dressed like an old woman walking around on Miami Beach, although, one could argue, that's what he was slowly turning into anyway. Don't you feel the heat? As I do, I I, I can't tolerate the sun. He fought hard to turn the film's big, climactic fight into a big, climactic party. He ordered the costume department to rig up an ice bucket that he could wear as a hat. He insisted that two-foot-four-inch Nelson de la Rosa appear with him, dressed as him, in every scene. This was later said to be the inspiration for Mini-Me in the Austin Powers movies. Actress Feruza Balk pulled Brando aside one day and asked him if they could discuss how their characters were supposed to relate to each other. And he put her off, admitting quietly that it didn't really matter. They were both getting paid, and besides, he hadn't read the script. Nothing Brando did made a lick of sense, until you realize that, at this point in his life, Brando was no longer an actor. He was an anarchist. 
And if the stories of the island of Dr. Moreau and the heart of darkness were about the folly of man's arrogance and his attempts to impose his order upon nature's order, which is chaos, then Brando was indeed the only one in both stories following the true script, that the natural order of nature is chaos. Well, Brando and the original director, Richard Stanley. See, there's a funny side note to this tale. Richard Stanley was fired from the movie, but no one ever checked to see if he left the island, which he had not. And one day, while on a location scout, several production assistants who were friendly with Stanley discovered him living in the jungle. You heard me. He, as they say, had gone native. And in a move that was right out of a movie, not so much the making of one, Richard Stanley snuck back onto his own set and worked as an extra on his own film. Behind a canine-like half-man, half-animal mask. He later said that he felt like his journey in Hollywood was complete. He had made the full circle from director to dog. Not surprisingly, the 1996 Island of Dr. Moreau with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer is an unintentionally hilarious train wreck of a movie, but watchable to that end. Utterly compelling is the documentary of its making, Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. It is from this documentary that I became aware of this entire story and the interview clips you have just heard. Please get it. It is fascinating. And if you really want to go deep dish, watch it with the excellent Apocalypse Now and its equally excellent making of documentary, Hearts of Darkness. Now, where do you get this stuff? It's simple. You go to danagool.com, click on our Amazon banner, and off you go. Get Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. Get The Island of Dr. Moreau. You certainly should get Island of Lost Souls. Pick up Patton Oswalt's book, Silver Screen Fiend. Pick up Laurie Jacobson's book, Hollywood Haunted. Or the documentary, Beast Wishes. Or the books, Monster Kid Memories. Or It Came From Bob's Basement, all about our friend, Bob Burns. You get what you want. And not for one extra penny, we get a few coins to keep the show running here. What else is for sale, you ask? Well, there's this. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the average price. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing that savings directly onto the consumer. They make an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Mattresses can often cost well over $1,500, but Casper mattresses cost just $500 for a twin-size mattress and $950 for a king-size mattress. Casper mattresses have just the right sink, just the right bounce. Two technologies, latex foam and memory foam, come together for a better night and a brighter day. And all Casper mattresses are made in America. They have a risk-free trial and return policy. Try sleeping on a Casper mattress for 100 days with free delivery and painless returns. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting Casper.com and using the promo code DANA. C-A-S-P-R dot com, promo code D-A-N-A. Now I know what you're saying. Dana, before we return to the podcast, surely there must be other ways for me to spend money. You're right. At DanaGool.com, you can become a member of our podcasting family by subscribing or just donating. Why not check out our merchandise store at ComedyFilmNerds.com? For Bevel Aqua heating and air conditioning t-shirts, Dana Gould Hour t-shirts, ringtones, as well as signed copies of my comedy LPs, Funhouse, and Let Me Put My Thoughts in You, or all three, including my new one, I Know It's Wrong, on CD. Or, new this month... How about a signed Dana Gould, our podcast poster? You can see its image on the thumbnail for this episode, created by the great Ben Walker. So do yourself a favor and check it out at danagould.com. Won't you? Here in person tonight, White Horse Drive in Theater, The Trial of the Dead. (laughs) 
18 living nightmares leap from the stage. All the lights go out and the monsters are released from their coffins. They may grab you. Victims from the audience will be thrown from the stage a piece at a time. Human heads chopped off. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. Extra on stage, back from the grave. The spirit materialization of Bruce Lee, king of Kung Fu. It's real. On stage, not a movie. You may need help. Help! Help! Tonight, White Horse Drive-In Theater. Welcome to Political Talk with two guys from Boston, a working man's look at the socio-political issues of our day. And now, Political Talk with two guys from Boston. This is Political Talk with two guys from Boston. I'm Johnny Condon. Robbie Solomon here. What's wrong with you? Lower intestine. Oh, you don't feel good? Yeah, it's like all clenched. You want to bag it? That'd be great. Ah, fuck it, we ain't getting paid. All right, good. Political Talk with two guys from Boston. (laughs) They come from miles to enjoy our intermission. For many of us, shaving is a pain. It's uncomfortable and razor blades are outrageously expensive. Harry's was started by two guys who wanted a better product without paying an arm and a leg to get it. Harry's makes their own blades. High-quality, high-performing German blades crafted by shaving experts. They offer a high-quality shave that's better for your face and for your wallet. Harry's blades are about half the price of the other big branded blades, and they ship for free to your front door. And here's exciting news from Harry's. They've officially launched two new products, foaming shave gel and aftershave moisturizer. The starter set is an amazing deal for $15. You get a razor, foaming shave gel, and three razor blades. So go to harrys.com now, and they'll give you $5 off if you type in my coupon code DANA, D-A-N-A, with your first purchase. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com, and enter the coupon code DANA. And check out at $5 off. And start shaving better today. Come and get them at the concession stand. It's showtime. He has killed four, maybe five women. He has drained every drop of blood from every one of them. Now, that is news, Vincenzo. News. And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. Call Shaq. You are an idiot. What movie, when you were a kid, Mm. just scared the fuck out of you? There's a Hammer movie that I've since seen that's actually not that good, but at the time, I don't know what it was. It's called The Screaming Skull. Yeah. Holy shit. There's something, this weird little skull coming out of the Mm -hmm. water, and just, ugh. That one really messed me up, and I remember very specifically because I was watching it late at night, and then I had to turn the TV off, so it was, I left in the scene where this skull like rises out of the water, and there's something really, really eerie about that shit. What about you? The TV movie the night stalker yeah you know i saw i was that, eight when i saw it oh well, then you were right you were ripe for it then yeah, uh, yeah. i saw it the night it premiered i saw it in january of no 1972 kidding. yeah we watched it and i know it was january 72 because i recently bought the tv guide that had it in it i just was wow. on, on ebay looking around there is a lot of creepy shit in that movie mm-hmm. specifically 
at the end of the movie when Darren McGavin, as Carl Kolshak, the reporter chasing this vampire, tracks the vampire to his house, he's taken this woman that people thought were dead and she's not dead and he has her handcuffed to a bed and he's using her to recycle plasma that oh, he stole wow. from a hospital. That's completely fucked up. On a and, TV movie. On a TV movie, 1972. Wow. Yeah, that, and he says, like, God, his own personal blood bank. That's really creep up. And then he hears the vampire come in. He hides in the closet. The vampire rips the closet door open. There's some really scary stuff in that. Wow. Um, and I was eight, which is probably <laughs> had a lot to do yeah, with it. That. But I do remember the next day at school, and I was in second grade, mm -hmm. And I remember for some reason being in one of the offices at school and all the adults going, did you see that movie last night on television? Like oh. for some reason, everybody watched that had the, it had the highest ratings of any yeah, TV it was, movie. It was crazy, right? Yeah. And people didn't understand. And it was just like, they just threw it on. They didn't have any anticipation of it being a big thing. And it wasn't until Roots, I think, was the next highest rated made for TV wow. movie. But that really scared the, the, the shit out of me. By the time I saw The Exorcist, I didn't. Uh, you were ready. I didn't see it until like 1987 right, right. or something. I didn't see uh, The Night Stalker until about 10 years ago. And I'm like, this is a really well – but I just was – it wasn't there to scare me. No, I it, saw it, it when I was right eight. When it needed to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there was some terrible movie called Day of the Animals where all the animals start attacking people. Again, if you watch it, it's not good. Right. But – there's a scene where a guy, just that feeling, and they capture it sometimes in movies where something is taking over, where they show, I love like ominous portents of things about to happen. So they do that earlier with this old guy, like he just is running out of his house. He just says, Martha, the rats have gone crazy or something like that. But the way he says it was so spooky, you know. <laughs> That's a great line. You know, there was one TV show that really – It's so much crazier than the rats are fine. Right, yeah, but, <laughs> but just don't right, – because it's like a dumb guy trying to describe something cosmic and that's, yeah. some, that's to me is terrifying when something really – Everything can't with the rats is par for the course. <laughs> <laughs> There was a show that Glenn Ford narrated called When Disaster Struck. Yeah, yeah. And it had, again, I was really young. And so when I would watch these things like, well, there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow. We have sure. to, oh, everything's going to catch on fire. Or they would, they would show like footage of like, I don't know, again, this, they're showing this during the day. Kids can watch this. <laughs> yeah. There was some like, they put dirge, anything on. There was some like dirgeable and there was all these guys hanging on, and then the thing got loose. It was like old. Oh, and 20s. you see the guys drop. <laughs> yeah, they're like, coming, and then they're like dropping and falling. <laughs> and I was like, uh, and that, show had a theme music that was like but it was a little organ playing it it was so eerie and creepy and then but behind the were these oh these oh, weird that, chorus yeah like that weird voice, and it just return of the jedi sword fight yes chorus. oh it just fucked me up man the night gallery scared the <laughs> shit out of me again because i was eight and nine and 10 years old. And there was two night gallery episodes that really scared me. And one also theme music, oh, night yeah. gallery theme music really spooky was so goddamn spooky. <laughs> yeah. Elsa Lanchester plays a woman that lives in a house. They're trying to buy her house so they can build a mall. Yeah. It's like Donald Trump is the villain in the movie, uh -huh. in the episode. She won't sell. They end up killing her, and they bury her in her garden, and she grows back. She comes back from the dead because <laughs> everything she plants in her garden grows. Oh. And so when they come in the end, she's sitting in the rocking chair laughing, but she's covered in vines. That was really what creepy. What the fuck? And then, yeah, and again, like <clears throat> nine years old. Yeah. Just, and then one where Vincent Price got chopped up with an axe and all of the parts of his body individually, like there's like a, a scene with like a foot and a hand are coming down the hallway separately. Oh, That's boy. That's really, really messed up. I remember. And I and I House guess, of Dark Shadows is one of the scariest goddamn movies I've ever I seen. I was too late for Dark Shadows. That whole thing passed me by. Yeah. Although House of Dark Shadows has a great line from the trailer, the final line in the trailer is, nobody lives there. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, very nice. And, the other, trailers, and they had 
a lot of good. winky sexual innuendo in the original I'm public sure just, Come yeah. see how the vampires do it. <laughs> but it's the House of Dark Shadows. I was technically too young for Dark Shadows. Yeah. But my brothers were into it. So oh. even though I was four and that was or five time, right? Yeah, it was four it was uh, four o'clock on ABC. But even though I was four, five, six, seven, eight years old, it was on all the time. So I knew about it. House of Dark Shadows came out in seventy or seventy one and I didn't see it until later. Oh, but wow. if you've never seen the movie House of Dark Shadows, it's really creepy. Oh, I'll check that it's out. It's really well made and really <clears throat> there's a certain sense in these early seventies horror movies, Last House on the Left has it, all those oh, hammer movies fuck. has it. Yeah, that movie. Um House of Dark Shadows has it. There's just a sense, a dread. A, yes. A, 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 Something in the film stock, in the lighting, in yeah. the set dressing. They just – well, they also were it's, very, very big. Even like – I remember a movie Something that, evokes <laughs> putrescence. There's a comedian named Blake Clark, and Blake was a platoon leader in Vietnam. Blake has seen some shit. Yeah, Blake has. Holy crap. <laughs> but but Blake said to me, the most frightened he ever was in his life was alone upstairs at night at the comedy store. Yes, I was a waitress at the comedy store. I was Let fully... Let me be the first to apologize. <laughs> I was fully immersed in the comedy world, you know, and, and then waiting for my giant career to take off. <laughs> I waitressed at the comedy store and... That place is so haunted. And Blake was um, performing there, and he was security at night there. Right. And uh, you Blake's know, a and, and, and Blake's a big dude. He was, I believe, he was a marine. You know, he's he's not Don Knotts. <laughs> you know, he's 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 a solid dude. And, and what people don't know is that the before the comedy store was the comedy store, it was Ciro's, and Ciro's, I believe, uh, was owned by the mafia. Ciro's was owned by a gentleman named Billy Wilkerson. He also, he owned another club down the street that later became the Trocadero. And he owned restaurants and he owned the Hollywood Reporter so that if you were seen at any of his nightclubs or restaurants, it was always reported in the paper the next day. So it was very good for your career to be seen at Ciro's and it made Ciro's the the most popular nightclub on the Strip, I would say, in Hollywood uh, it, during the golden age of Hollywood glamour. Billy Wilkerson was at a soda shop, the Top Hat Malt Shop, um, across from Hollywood High and discovered a young Lana Turner who was uh, skipping typing class. And um, and r really just walked over to her and said, would you like to be in the movies? So, I mean, those things did that happen. That never works for me. <laughs> you know, but it happened. It did What happen. kind of movies? I'm going to make it with my phone. <laughs> 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 so, um, so he was, uh, he was renowned. Um, actually, you know, actually it was his idea to build Las Vegas and he, Sadly, in looking for money for that, went to Bugsy Siegel uh, to borrow some money, and Siegel just, you know, took the idea over. So everyone thinks it was Siegel's idea, but it was Billy Wilkerson's idea. It so, certainly makes more sense. And, and Billy Wilkerson haunts the uh, the uh, offices of the old Hollywood Reporter. I think they were taken over by the L.A. Weekly. The offices of the LA Weekly are not being haunted by profits. That's all I know. <laughs> oh, that's sad. <laughs> but um, so anyway, so Ciro's uh, being as popular as it was, uh, you mentioned Mickey Cohn, another uh, famous gangster. What club is that popular? The mafia, you know, wanted a piece of it every week. Mickey Cohn would send an empty hat box to Ciro's with a note that basically said, please fill this with money and send it back. Love, Mickey. <laughs> and, you know, that's what they did. And the cops were aware that 
Mickey was getting money uh, from these places, but they never saw it change hands. They just saw delivery men delivering hats. And so Blake Clark, every night, he would regale us with what he had seen the night before. Like oh, one night, I just loved this story. He was leaving and he was the last person out and his wife was picking him up. It must have been three in the morning. And he's leaving the back entrance of the club after he'd locked everything up. And he's walking toward her car and he sees her face of horror and he turned around and there was the ghost of a man like peering around the corner well, making sure Blake was gone yep he's gone we can party now you know but she, she saw it too but he you know they saw men in wide lapel striped suits walking in and out of the offices um one night in the in the the main room there were lights left on on stage and he climbed the stage to turn the lights off and he turned around and like 70 chairs from the room were suddenly piled on the stage. I mean, he had his back turned for one minute and 70 chairs were in a heap on the stage. Coins often fell from the ceiling. Whenever Sam Kinison would go on, the ghosts absolutely hated his act. <laughs> he's the only comic I know who was heckled from beyond. But, but Blake, they loved Murray Langston. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> but they hated Sam and something would always go wrong. The lights would go out. The sound would go out. Sam challenged the ghosts one night, you know, and, and asked. Because Sam, by the way, was a Pentecostal preacher. Yeah. So but, he would he would be uh, <clears throat> someone prone to getting into that back and forth. And they, you know, he screamed. I mean, he yelled a lot in his act, if, if you remember. Oh, I remember it well. <laughs> like, like those preachers. And right. they hated that. The ghosts hated that. And Blake actually heard them moaning. At first, he couldn't understand. He was in the main room and, and um, Sam was on in the smaller original room and Blake was just sitting it out in the main room and he heard this weird noise, bism, bism. And, and he listened and listened and finally he could understand that it was saying, it's him, it's him. And they were moaning that Sam was on. You know, he heard things, he saw things, he heard women in the in the ladies' room after the club was closed, uh, talking about two-timing that heel and, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, it was just wonderful stuff. Dated um, echoes of conversations from <laughs> decades past. And people sitting there and when the club was closed, sitting, having drinks, or he'd approach them, excuse me, you know, what are you doing here? And they would simply disappear. Um, people often return. It's not only bad, ac tragic activities that uh, attract ghosts, but people often return to places that they loved or have a wonderfully fond memory of, or to a, an event, say, their their child's wedding, where they just might want to be present, um, but they won't be haunting that place. It's very human emotions, I feel, that bring people, uh, bring spirits back to these places. Now, so, let me, so, but uh, what, the point <coughs> that I wanted to make was, the comedy store, formerly Ciro's, where did all these ghosts come from? The theory is a lot of people walked into Ciro's and didn't walk out. Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, Barry Taff uh, investigated the club with me and we took the steps to the basement. And one of Barry's psychic gifts is uh, that he can really feel pain or illness and uh he w collapsed on the steps in in terrible pain like like his legs were being broken going down to the basement okay right so um so this is the scariest story that Blake ever told me w one night Blake 
and the bartender were the only people in the club. And the basement didn't have a door. It had a a grating across it, like a freight elevator. Uh Uh-huh. You know, one of those collapsible... Yeah, accordion door. Yes. So... All of a sudden, the the accordion door starts to shake, and Blake and the bartender, Louie, look over, and they see this black shadow in the basement pushing against the grate and pushing so hard that they think the whole grate is going to rip out of the wall. And finally, the shadow seems to push through the grate, and the grate you know, is is slaps back into place and there in front of them. Now, mind you, the hallway is black. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, people who've never been in the comedy store, it's painted black. Yes. And I think it was painted black because is there no surface where it's easier to spot dropped cocaine? <laughs> So, um, so the and there's this big red exit light, you know, and that's all that's lighting this hallway. And Blake tells me that he sees a uh, six foot plus figure, blacker than the black walls, and it is making a horrible noise and moving toward them and he and Louie probably beat my land speed record that night and they just ran and they you know and Blake told the owner of the comedy store I'm never ever going to the basement but one afternoon the owner wants him to go to the basement Blake said the only way I'll go is if I take two other people with me and the three of them walk down the stairs to the basement, and they are no sooner down there than one of the guys sees this black shadow start to rise from a corner of the room. Now, Blake couldn't see it this time, but the guy is screaming. He's holding his hands out, yelling, no, no, stay away. And Blake didn't have to see it. He knew what was happening. So he grabbed the guy's hands, and Blake said they were burning hot like they were being held on a stove. And yet it was freezing in the room and they could all see their breath and they were scrambling up the stairs to get out of there and a piece of cardboard dropped from out of nowhere and hit Blake on the hands and he picked it up and it had his name written on it. We're just getting into a Halloween season here in, in L.A. Yeah. And I'm looking at my calendar and I'm thinking, okay, like I have to go to Griffith Park Haunted Hayride. Yeah. I have to go to Not Scary Farm. I need to go to Universal Studios Halloween Haunt. I used to go to the Pierce College Haunted Corn Maze. <laughs> that is sadly no more. Yeah. But all things they have, by the way, these, you would do even if you didn't have kids. Oh no, yes. no, my kids can't go to those. They're too scary for yes. me. Really? Yeah, yeah right. my kids. Oh, yeah, no. I go with Rob Cohen and Ken Daly. <laughs> yeah. um, but back when we're talking about in the late sixties, early seventies, mm-hmm. they didn't have that stuff. No, Halloween has become a giant Huge. business, Huge. Oh, and I support God. it completely. Oh, me too. But in the sixties and seventies, if you grew up in Southern California and you wanted to go something like an elaborate Halloween show. There was only one place to go, and that was your house. <laughs> I guess. It never has looked real good. It always kind of looked like but there are house, But yeah. there are documentaries made about this, and there are books written yeah, about this, and magazine yeah. articles about this. You were, you know, the, the sort of the uh, progenitor of, of these elaborate home haunted house displays that people do. Well, it, it started, really, when Kathy and I, one time, I, I'd read about the uh, razor blades and the apples and the poison candy and all the right. stuff that they were doing to kids. And Halloween, when I was a little kid, was really big. They had the old cheesecloth masks and stuff, things like that. But we had a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, I loved it. And, and it just made me sick to hear that these kids are being put upon like this. And so they weren't going out much at night anymore, you know. Yeah, there was a period in the, in the was. early 70s yeah. where Halloween got real dodgy. You know, we've got we to take care of this. 
why don't we put on a Halloween show? The kids can come by. We'll give them candy. You know, so they, and they know it's good and everything else. And that's really how it started. Now, I happen to have some extremely talented friends next to Frank I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, that I do have. And, uh, aside uh, from Frank and myself, you're well, telling that, me that you it, have yes, talented yeah, friends. And, uh, anyway, uh, we'll they, take your word for it. They kind of, you know, <laughs> we were talking one time and they said, geez, why don't we help you out? We'll build some set things or something. Do some crazy stuff. And that's really how it started. I've always said, and, and I still say it today, mainly they just used my yard. All these talented people came over and used my yard and did something incredible with it. What year was your first big Halloween display? 65, I think, something. That was just a haunted house interior type uh-huh. thing. Because you used to have the people just look through our front porch. Well, you can't get a whole lot of people. Same house? No, no, different one. Okay. Up the street, same place. Burbank. I love Burbank. And when you see a movie like Edward Scissorhands or the uh, stop motion Frankenweenie, which is really underrated, that sort of stereotypical vision Mm -hmm. of a mid century neighborhood yeah. all comes from both those movies Tim Burton who grew up in Burbank yes he did he's just showing you Burbank that's pretty and much. it's real yeah. uh, it still exists and we're in one of those neighborhoods as we speak and yeah. what I find so incredible is like seeing that stuff before you live in Southern California it looks like a daydream of somebody's vision yeah. of a suburban yeah. neighborhood and then you come out here and like yeah. oh no it's real it's right yeah. there well, the last the last show we did was The Thing the Arnest I was thing. at that yeah. show and that was the biggest set we ever made. I mean, yeah. that covered my whole front yard, my whole driveway. That was 2002. Everything. Yeah, that was the last one we did. And I talked Frank into being a uh, doctor. <laughs> what do you call it? Yeah, uh, yeah. It was, he had to talk me into Captain it. Captain Henry. <laughs> no, I did. Oh, Frank, you've got to do it for me. You've got it. Frank, get up. Get up. Off the floor. He turned out, we had some other people in the show, too. We had like two different casts. And well, stuff. Jake Garber, who's one of the big makeup yes. effects and, and, guys from K and B, was the thing. Like and, yeah. Jim Arness. It yeah. was the most amazing thing I ever saw. Yeah. Not now, he looks like Rob Zombie. Yeah, I haven't yeah, seen Jake lately. Now, yeah. Or maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe a beat up Tarzan. Yeah, he looks here. like Grizzly so Adams. Yeah, basically, yeah. 20 times a night, I'd have to yes, you f- I'd have to battle Jake Garber in this yeah. in these wonderful makeup yeah. that um, John Goodwin did yeah. some of the makeup. And yeah, and Greg- we, we had this fellow, I can't think of his name mm-hmm. now, that we got. He just wanted to do it. For the credit, just to do it. You know, sure. But Greg, Greg Nicotero, yeah. Walking Dead, played a big role in oh, putting together did. that final he show. Well, he's the guy that created the makeup. This is not like what your neighbors yeah. do. This is like no. you're walking through a display at Disneyland. Yeah. But what? Dorothy Fontana, who's DC Fontana, by of the way. Star Trek they, fame. They yeah. Star Trek. She wrote the script for it. I did not know the Dorothy yeah, wrote I still yeah. have my copy of that script. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. yeah. I'll be on eBay later this week, Yeah, folks, I figured it would. Yeah. A movie that kind of messed me up, not in a really haunting way, but because it got it so right, was when I first saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Not the UFO stuff, which was thrilling, but the scenes of Richard Dreyfuss' family, and the family is coming apart, and they're just fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because like, at the time, my parents were having some trouble in their marriage. They resolved it, but there was a lot of fighting in my house. And not only did they get the way that a marriage comes apart, but the set dressing on the house was, oh, it was perfect. It's like flawless, yeah. Watching that was real. And I bet a lot of kids, people my age now, that remember back on Close Encounters are like, yeah, the scenes were... Richard Dreyfuss is basically losing his family. Yeah, when, it's really terrifying. When he is in the tub dressed and and, <coughs> oh, and, uh, and she's staring at him, Terry and Gar. And starts crying. Yeah, and he's like, I don't know what's happening to me. Like That's like, yeah, I've been there. Oh, God. And, and when we he, had a couple mornings where, Dad fell asleep in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Daddy funny? Well, like, when, he starts, in front of the toilet. when he starts messing with the mashed potatoes and the kids start crying. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> you're hitting too close to home. <laughs> Yeah. How do you know Steven Spielberg did not have kids when he made that movie? Oh, he leaves. He leaves, he leaves the fucking planet. Yeah, yeah. Which you would <laughs> no, never. No, uh, no father would do that. Yeah. I think even Dreyfus said, yeah, looking back at the movie, like you wouldn't just. No, he that's... literally walks off the planet. The planet. By the way, and doesn't even look back. No. <laughs> Bye. Out. Yep. See ya. My mom's favorite night gallery episode. She would always describe this to me growing up, and I, I realized much later was the one that Spielberg directed with Joan, Joan Crawford. Crawford with the that's eyes. the pilot. Oh, that was the pilot? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, but that was her favorite. And that's very much a Twilight Zone episode. It very, really— yeah, That was the link yeah, between and that them. was the link, yeah. Again, when I was little, a lot of my experiencing horror movies, because I 
really didn't. It's the thing that my parents kept me from them. You just couldn't get to the theater unless someone took you. Right. My parents were like, well, I'm not going to take you to go see Halloween. You know, right. so it was these trailers on TV. Those are some of my scariest memories. And the trailer for It's Alive is one of the scariest movie trailers okay. ever made. If you say the movie I'm thinking of, I'm going okay. <laughs> to. Okay. <laughs> it's Alive, it really quickly, is one of the scariest trailers for one of the shittiest movies ever made. When the trailer comes, yeah. I was like, nope, you don't need to see it because yeah. I start crying. If you go down Mulholland and mm-hmm. take the first left yeah. and follow that, that's all the street where that It's left Alive on- is shot. That left on a Mulholland is scarier than the entire movie, by the way. Yes, so that, it literally is scarier. <laughs> yes. That's more frightening. That's how bad that movie is. <laughs> Second one was a trailer for And mo- that's the same neighborhood they went trick-or-treating in in E.T. Oh. Second trailer was a trailer for a movie called Asylum. At one point, there's a little tiny robot with an old man head on it, like walking down. It is one of the scariest oh, things. Wow, that's fucked up. Go and watch Asylum trailer. It was like an old early – it was like one of those anthology movies. Sure, yeah. With telling stories. And just that one image, all my friends are like, what the fuck? Oh my God. <laughs> <clears throat> and the third trailer was this really – I didn't even bother to but it's called Mutations. Oh, you didn't get the one that And that. Mutations has – it was one of those movies where they have – they use actual circus freaks in yeah. the movie. So there's a guy that can pop his eyes out. Free and it, yeah, and but it's in color and it's that really oversaturated early 70s exploitation yeah. color. So the trailer – Again, for a movie that I'm sure is dog shit, but the way that the trailers were together, it just looks nonstop mayhem and terror. What's the trailer that fucked you up? TV commercial. Mm-hmm. Magic. Oh, I don't know that trailer. The commercial. What, was Magic? I, the TV commercial with Magic with Anthony Hopkins. Hang on. Was Magic a TV movie or a movie in no, theaters? It was a movie. It was a movie in the theaters. Okay. And all I remember, and everybody saw that, everybody hated it. I just remember the, it was a close up on a ventriloquist dummy, mm-hmm. and it you know it's moving its eyes, and it says oh "Hocus God. Pocus, we take her to bed. Magic is fun. We're dead." And it was just extreme the- close up oh. on a ventriloquist dummy shifting its eyes, and that and I was like, "Fuck off, fuck off!" Well, there's a and mo- basically a remake of a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. British movie called Dead of Night, another anthology film of short things. And three of the stories are like, meh. Then there's a story at the end, and I watched a documentary. It's an Ealing film. So I watched a documentary on yeah. Ealing films, and they said there was a generation of British kids. This came out in like 45, I think. They all were like, the last story in Dead of Night. It fucked up a generation of kids. They talked to like Johnny Rotten. He's like, that fucking movie. <laughs> and it's, there's a guy in, um, he's in a that. jail cell and he's sitting there with a ventriloquist dummy and he's committed murder and he's like, the, the dummy did it. And they're like, shut up, you fucking loon. Right. And then there's a shot at the end and he's yelling back and forth to the dummy and the dummy's talking to me like, oh, it's in his mind. Right. And they, it's really brilliant in the shot. We're like, oh, it's the guy going nuts until the last shot where this dummy stands up and it's like a little kid. Right. But they, it's all shot black and white shadow insta- and then just wa- and strangles the guy. It is <laughs> and he's screaming and at this point no one's listening to him because he's been yelling all night. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. it's just and it is out of nowhere the fucking scariest shit you've ever seen. Even by today's standards. Right. That's one of those movies where would you let your kids watch certain things I'm like yeah but there are certain even old like Freaks Nosferatu. I mean, I talk about yeah. my book how Nosferatu fucked me up, projected it, and that's another one I would never let a kid watch Dead of Night. It is so that just that one segment is so scary. Early seventies, mm-hmm. same thing. TV movie yeah. trilogy of terror. I knew you were going to get to that one. Well, this is the same idea. It's the same idea. Fucking think with that goddamn oh, god. The Zuni fetish doll. Fuck that. Ugh. And again, the screaming, but over time drives you insane. Yeah, insane. And also made worse, again, saw it the night it premiered. <laughs> Later in the middle of the night, my older brother threw my G.I. Joe on what me. fucking <laughs> asshole. Wow. <laughs> and I lost my you shit. You must have. That's another one. I just rewatched that, and the whole thing is terrifying. And then I forgot how fucking horrifying the end is. No, it's awful. The end, that is one of the f- most frightening final shots. Yeah. Where she's just squatting. With the knife. Banging the knife and waiting for her mom to be like, yeah. oh, dear God, this yeah. is awful. That movie is amazing. <laughs> that yeah. movie is Fuck. I believe that segment was written by Richard Matheson. That wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. The whole movie probably was. Yeah, Matheson. I thought they were all based on Matheson stories. It probably was, yeah. 
This was later when I was in college. I was not ready to be as fucked up by this movie as I was. There's a, a movie called Pet Cemetery. Oh, of course. Stephen King yeah. movie, which is, is – it's, it's good. But there are two sequences. One where Fred Gwynn is talking about the father who brought his boy back, mm-hmm. who died in World War I. And those scenes of him walking up the yeah. road and the woman screaming, that scared the shit out yeah, of me. And then – Zelda, the sister with spina bifida back in the bedroom. You'll be in bed forever. Never get out of bed again. That is so fucking terrifying. And even in the theater, people were just cringing. Yeah. Again, this is at the time that I was seeing a lot of horror movies, and there was a lot of shitty ones out. So I was just like, all right, you know, Nightmares and Tales from the Crypt and Cat's Eye. Uh, I see Maximum Overdrive. And Pet Cemetery seemed like the Ramones did the theme. It'll be fun. And and it was a good book. I read the book. The book was terrific. Well, here we go. Let's see what they do. And whoa, I wasn't ready for that shit. I was on Alex Bennett with Stephen King. What? When he was promoting Maximum Overdrive. The one that he directed. Yeah. Which and he remember, now admits he was on Coke yeah, morning, noon, and night. <laughs> morning, doing, noon, and night. Yeah. And he said at the time, and I can't remember if Alex asked this or I, if I asked this, but it was, um, would you say that Maximum Overdrive is the scariest film this summer? And he said, I will say it's the loudest. <laughs> <laughs> The scariest manifestation story that I know. My mother grew up in uh, the woods in Virginia and was called a holler. And she tells this very gothic story of a little, you know, house, cabiny house out in the woods in Virginia during the Depression. My mom was born in 1933. Young couple with baby, guys out of work angry, comes home one night, drunk, raving, something goes wrong, kills his wife, throws their infant into the fire, Mm. takes his own life, and the house burns down. And the only thing remaining is the chimney in the fireplace. Everything else was wood, but that was brick. So that's still there. So it's when you walk out in the woods, sometimes you see the shell of an old house in the fireplace and chimney's still sort of there. And she would say at night when they would walk home from town and they would come within proximity of the shell of that house, on certain nights you could still hear the baby screaming. Oh. I find that 100% believable, that there's just such a disruption in the natural order of things that it leaves behind a ripple or an echo that will not be quieted. I have no problem believing that whatsoever the headless ghost of beverly glenn beverly glenn was a main thoroughfare for farmers to bring either their their crops or their wares or their animals to market from the san fernando valley to los angeles and it was an arduous journey And there were many roadhouses on Beverly Glen along the way for them to spend the night. Oh, okay. And these roadhouses were typically three stories. The first story was like the mud room where you took off all your your dirty clothing and there was a dining area down there. And the second floor was the salon uh, living room area where you might meet with other guests there and exchange information and news. And the third floor were the bedrooms. At some point, I think during the prohibition years, they were, they were brothels and there are many tunnels in that area as well. Um, where they have found uh, old booze and bottles. Anyway, one of these roadhouses uh, was converted uh, in the 60s to an apartment building. And one, uh, you know, each floor was a separate living quarters. This one particular roadhouse 
had um, a lot of paranormal activity and the occupants of each level felt something differently, felt, felt something different. The, the person in the middle on the second floor always heard footsteps on the stairs. That's all they heard. They heard footsteps on stairs that weren't there any longer. Um, they had been removed. At one point, they were inside, but they had been removed when the place was made into separate living quarters. Um, the people downstairs on the first floor had a lot of physical activity. There was a, a romantic gentleman caller that they never saw. There was two girls, two roommates. He climbed in bed with them and spooned them. Uh, he brushed their hair. They felt him stroking their hair as they brushed it. Uh, when they were getting ready to leave for the day, he would do romantic things like hide their keys, playful things. And once one of the girls said he got into the car with her. She felt him go leave the house with her and get into the car with her. And she turned to the empty seat next to her and explained that the world had changed a great deal since he had seen it. And she felt that it was better that he stayed at the home and he left the car. People on the first floor also, they heard a man crying outside their window occasionally. The people on the third floor heard footsteps running. Even though it didn't happen, they would feel their, the front door to their apartment burst open. And they said at that point, uh, every hair on their, on their body was standing up straight and they felt a presence in the room. They heard huffing and puffing, as, as would be normal, racing up a flight of stairs. And, uh, and one night, from their window, they saw the ghost of a headless man in a yellow suit with a cape. Finally, all of the residents got together. They exchanged all their stories and they presented it to the landlord of the building who told them this, that at the turn of the century, a farmer's wife used to love to go to the theater in Los Angeles. The farmer didn't enjoy it so much. So she would come uh, and she would spend the night after the theater. She would spend the night in this roadhouse. And at this roadhouse, or perhaps at the theater, she met this young dandy. And they began an affair. And they stayed at the roadhouse together. And someone informed the farmer of his wife's indiscretion and... The farmer went to the roadhouse and discovered that they were there. And I think that's the man crying outside when he realizes that it's true. And then he apparently ran up the three stories of stairs, burst into their room, caught them together, and beheaded the young dandy with his... Sith, scythe, whatever you call those. Some th people call it a sling blade. Some people call <laughs> it a kaiser blade. <laughs> yeah, that thing. Right. So uh, I don't know what became of the wife, and sh her presence is not felt there. But the dandy remains there. If they were in flagrant delecti and he was beheaded, he literally has... Unfinished business. <laughs> ah, yes. Unfinished business is another big reason for spirits to return. Every presidency since Lincoln has seen Lincoln's ghost in the White House. Um, I think even Obama's children have seen him. He wasn't finished. <laughs> I was unaware of that, but it makes perfect sense. Yes. You could tell the difference between Lincoln's ghost and Kennedy's because Kennedy's, boo, <laughs> I am a ghost, boo. 
<laughs> Talk about it's, somebody that will come in and spoon you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Well, Lincoln has even shown up um, famously in a photograph, a presidential uh, family portrait, you know, and you can clearly see Lincoln in the in the background. Which which uh, president? Oh, you know, I don't remember the family, oh, okay. but the photographer uh, is very famous, and her last name is White. Okay, and she's a very very famous photographer. When you were a kid, if you were a monster kid growing up, when I grew up in the in the, in the 70s and mm-hmm. 80s, there were two magazines. <laughs> there was Famous Monsters Magazine right. by Forrest Ackerman. Yes. And a magazine called Starlog. Yep. And the first I ever heard of you was in an article in Starlog Magazine. Starlog mm-hmm. 18. About yeah. your Halloween shows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, it's like I'm a kid in, in the middle of Massachusetts, yeah. light years away from this. And I'm like, oh, God, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to live. And you did in the late 70s, you did a an alien-themed yes. Halloween show. 79. And Walter Koenig yeah. of Star Trek, Chekhov on yeah. Star Trek, was in the cast of your Halloween show. Yeah. So people would come to a house in Burbank, go to a very elaborate <laughs> stage presentation of the film Alien, and yeah. Chekhov is in it. Yeah. Yeah. That star log had this big article about the shows that Bob and Kathy had put on for many years. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like it was on another planet. So far away. It was so far away. And if you right. had told me when I was 14 reading that magazine that one day I would actually be in one of those shows one acting, the best, fighting the thing from another <laughs> world yeah. for Bob Burns, I would yeah. not have believed you. Yeah. I couldn't possibly even yeah. imagine it. it was, and those shows are legendary now. Oh, they were just so yeah. much fun. I look at them now, I don't even know how we did some of them because they were live illusion shows. You yeah. couldn't go at take two. No, an it was you, in there. And, it would, and for the people that understand, yeah. it's just like going to the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland. Like yep. you queued up, right. you went in, it's like, okay, you five can go in and you'd go That's and do exactly it and then you'd happened. reset it and you'd yep. do it again. And we would do um, it 20 times a night. There was a Christian haunted house that was done years ago called Hell House. And it was a Halloween display, mm-hmm. but all of the set pieces where someone goes to a party and gets roofied and raped, so, and then she no. becomes a drug addict and dies, oh, and then she has this to get real? an abortion. Yeah, it was called. It's called Hell House, oh, that and it is a, a pro-life Christian conservative <laughs> haunted house based on a pro-life Christian conservative uh, mores and views. Completely legitimate, and yeah. if you like it, good for you. Um, no, I'm not here to point fingers, but I was part of a group of snide Hollywood <laughs> jerks who. Bought the rights to it and put it on as a <clears throat> Halloween display in Hollywood. And we called it Hollywood Hell House. But we didn't do it tongue in cheek. We yeah. did it exactly yeah. as it was written. Right. And we did it at the Steve Allen Theater. And I was the abortion doctor. And one night I, I gave uh, my friend Daisy, I think, 29 abortions uh, <laughs> over a two-hour period. Ouch. And, and I had like a foot pedal that shot blood onto my thing. So by the end, we just like to throw the clothes away. They were covered in corn syrup, foot sticking. Did you hang the up the shingle after that was over? <laughs> it's hard to articulate the depth of your collection for people who want to familiarize themselves with it and see it there is a book called it came from bob's basement mm. which is available on uh, amazon and yeah and, uh, it's all around here. yeah they're trying and, to get rid of them and there's another book called monster kid, kid memories. memories yeah that's my favorite and the documentary is called Beast Wishes. I'm not sure that's my favorite yet. Yeah. <laughs> still working at that. I don't know yet. And it still hasn't gotten when they, when they yeah. first came over. And Forey Ackerman's documentary is called Spanks for the Memories. <laughs> yes. I haven't seen okay. that one yet. I've got to see that. Here come the villagers with the pitchforks <laughs> yeah. and the torches. But no, when, when Frank and Trish first came over with their idea of doing this, the first thing Kathy and I said when they did a pitch and all that kind of stuff is, 
No thanks. <laughs> no thanks. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I, no. I can't imagine. Finally, he just ended up saying the typical thing they say in Hollywood. We're going to make it anyway, whether you like <laughs> yeah. it or not. So yeah. Whether you like it or not. You yes. might as well like it. And he yeah. says, well, we might as well because they'll pull all the dirt out of it and use everything yeah. they can. We're going to make it anyway. Yeah, That's so f- I am very thrilled with it now. I, I'm, I'm honored by it, as a matter of fact. It's not about anything other than uh, really what marriage is. Uh, it's a love what story. What a great, successful I, I guess, marriage yeah. is. Yeah. Because we didn't want it to be about us. Or like, And I say that as somebody with 11 restraining orders against me. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got four, so I'm doing all right. It wasn't a really, it was a really very important thing that we determined early on with Beast Wishes that if we, we couldn't make a movie that was just going to be about the collection no. and about no. the Halloween shows and the fact that Bob was a gorilla – uh, for many years, we made a love story that yeah. that a love story that lasts fifty over yeah. fifty years that just happens to have monsters in it as right. well. Yeah. Right, it's what brought you. It's what brought you together. Yeah. Last year, I took my daughter. Her friend goes to a school in Los Feliz. This really fun. Really groovy magnet school. It's very super creative and really neat. And they have a big Halloween carnival where there's games. Mm -hmm. Let's go. The kindergartners, the kindergartners had done a haunted house. You come in our haunted house? Oh, you know, let's go to the kindergartners have a little haunted house. And it was... At one point, the other thing was, you know, you use trash bags to make hallways to line, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, they make the maze. So at one point, I'm sure this happened by accident, my daughter is in my arms and she's hugging me because there's like, again, there's dummies. Yeah, it's like, scary. So it's, it's good, whatever. I turned the corner of, of the trash bag hallway to the new hallway and there was a little kid, a little kindergartner that I guess had lost his station. He was wearing a monster mask. He was supposed to pop up somewhere else, but he was just walking. And they had a red strobe light. So try to imagine it's this little kindergartner's body with a giant adult monster mask kind of at a distance, kind of walking down this hallway. And I was... I couldn't move. I was so – there was something – and I, I wanted to call – I mean I'm, I'm kind of acquaintances with Rob Zombie and, I, and, and Eli Roth. I know they do these big monster yeah. maze. I'm like, get toddlers, <laughs> put adult-sized heads on them, and let them wander randomly. People will fucking shit their pants. Yeah. You save money on the, on the dry ice <laughs> and the, all that other bullshit. It was yeah. one of the most – there was something – this tiny body with this giant head, and it's – again, it's not coming – at me, but it's coming toward me. Like the, it was so one of the That's scary, amazing. and it was last year. And yeah, I had sure. not gotten over that. And again, it was all by accident. It was this kid was looking for where he's. I'm supposed to jump at us. <laughs> so he's just in this empty hallway with a red strobe light. And I'm like, the fuck is this? I just, I you just drop your daughter. You're on your own. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Lord, I'm leaving. Bring the bring the close encounter spaceship down. I'm off the planet. Goodbye. <laughs> nope, not happening. Doesn't even say goodbye. Fuck. These Hollywood unsolved murders, to bring us back to Hollywood, as I said, it's human emotion, I think, that brings people back. And so if your death was written off or everybody knew who did it and he's walking around free, the ghost of George Reeves is a perfect example. George Reeves lived in Coldwater Canyon. Right. And... and you can stand at the highest point in Coldwater Canyon and say, well, George Reeves was murdered and he was definitely murdered in his house. And that's right over there. There's the home of Paul Byrne and Gene Harlow. And Paul Byrne committed suicide there. And uh, the dentist who purchased it after that, like someone drowned in his swimming pool and... Later, the house was purchased by Jay Sebring. Who, unfortunately, met an untimely demise of his own. Yes, at the highest point in Coldwater Canyon, which was where uh, the home that Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski rented. Hence the name El Cielo Drive. Yes. So what 
the hell is that? You know, I mean, you can, you, you, and, and the most horrific crime in Hollywood history is at the highest point in this canyon. And from this canyon, I can point to all of these other uh, places where very negative things occurred. And at the bottom of the hill uh, leading up to the canyon, when they were building up the canyon, they found um, Native American graves. So they think there was some battle down below. Now, if you are coming to Los Angeles and you want to get in on the haunt, my suggestion would be to stay at the Roosevelt Hotel. And I'm going to read to you a short paragraph from your book. The Roosevelt Hotel, located right across the street from the also haunted Chinese theater. The, the epicenter of the golden age of Hollywood. Famously, actor Montgomery Clift lived in the Roosevelt Hotel in room 928 for three months in 1952 while he was in Los Angeles filming From Here to Eternity. And they say that he often paced the hallway of the hotel, rehearsing his lines and practicing playing the bugle. Maids have often felt something cold brush by them in that section of the hotel. On a night in November of 1992, a guest staying in room 928 felt a hand patting her shoulder while she lay in bed reading. She turned over to say goodnight to her husband, but he was sound asleep. That's the Roosevelt Hotel. Why is this place so haunted? Oh, well, I find hotels are often this scene of uh, great emotion, comings and goings and partings, and um, the Hollywood Roosevelt uh, was the first grand hotel in Hollywood as the movie industry was was coming into its own. There was no f- fabulous hotel in Hollywood. So Mary Pickford and Doug Fairbanks built this place. It was s- the scene of such tremendous highs and lows, I think, for people that... Um, Emotionally charged. Yes, there you go. People have seen um, and heard a man playing the piano in a lovely white suit and very old shoes. And he's also been seen walking the hallways and uh, leaving, walking out of um, an exit door that leads to a fire escape, which is, is closed now, and then he simply disappears. Monty was going through a very terrible time uh, during those three months that he lived there. Um, You know, he was a really unhappy person. Uh, He was gay in a at a time and in a climate where it was terribly unpopular and would have been the end of his career. Uh, He was trapped in so many ways. When I went there, I went into the bath. I didn't feel anything in the main room with the beds, nothing. I went into the bathroom, which was not remodeled, and I still didn't feel anything. But when I got to the sink and I looked into the mirror, I felt tremendous sadness. And I, I literally felt a huge weight on my shoulders. And I just thought, wow, you know, how many times did he stare in this mirror and and ask why? He was in a terrible car accident on Coldwater Canyon. Right. As a matter of fact, but that that altered his appearance uh dramatically. His, his face was quite smashed up. Um he was in the middle of making a movie with Elizabeth Taylor who was very his very close friend, and he was leaving her house, and he was quite drunk and, and on pills, and Coldwater Canyon's very windy, and he uh, crashed, and actually, she r- raced down there to the scene and reached into his throat and pulled out teeth, because he was strangling. She was quite abroad, I'll tell you. But um, it Uh, added to his uh, unbelievable depression and people only went to that terrible movie uh, Raintree County to see 
the scenes that were shot before and the scenes that were shot after to tell see the new Monty and the old Monty. Oh, is um, it that obvious in the movie? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Truly, the light went out of his eyes. Um, things were severed in his, in his um, upper lip, so he could not use his upper lip anymore. You know, for an actor, that's, that could be death. You know, so it just sent him further into the bottle and further in, into the pills, and that's really what killed him. And how did he die? I mean, he was young and he, you know, had a, a caregiver uh, that had been a former uh, prize fighter, uh, someone strong enough to carry him from room to room because at the end it was that bad. And I, I think he was in his 40s. Something ridiculously young, and he just simply died. But it's interesting that you say uh, that you went from George Reeves to Monty Clift because the connective thread is one of Monty Clift's best friends, Jack Larson, who played Jimmy Olsen on The Adventures of Superman with George Reeves. George Reeves was well aware that m- the majority of his fans were children, and he would have been devastated. With those headlines that children saw. Yeah. Superman kills himself, you know. That did not happen. There were bullet holes all over that place. And And the woman that he was living with, was it Hollywood Kryptonite is one of the books? Lenore Lemon. Yeah, Lenore Lemon, that's what it was. She also had a very dodgy past, dodgy acquaintances. They interviewed her the next day. Did you and George have a fight that night? And her response was, no, we we didn't have no beef. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, was never heard from again. Again, I think, you know, somebody laid a big sum of money on her and said, get, get out of here, lady. Because right. she was 86 from every nightclub in New York because of her loud mouth and uh, her, her drunken brawls. <laughs> You know, George Reeves was such a gentleman. What he was doing with this woman, I don't know. I think he broke up with her that night, and she was not having that. You're scaring me. First time I went to your house, I think I went there for the first time with Joel Hodgson. You did. And... We're walking around. I've never forgiven him. Our our jaws are on the floor. And you say, right there is the flying saucer from Plan 9 from Outer Space. Mm -hmm. And I immediately, in my mind, go, well, he must mean Ed Wood, because (laughs) there's no way it could be from Plan 9 from Outer Space. The whole point of Plan 9 from Outer Space was everything was a dollar and a quarter. But then you let me hold it, Mm -hmm. which, again, (laughs) is freakish for me. Having seen that movie so many times and having it being such a part of my sort of cinema love. And I'm holding it in my hand. And it is from Plan 9 from Outer Space. It certainly is. Dollar 95 they, kit. Yeah, they were not paper <laughs> They were not paper plates. No. They were an over-the-counter hobby kit. Lindbergh put it out. Lindbergh put it out. Right. But this was not one of the Lindbergh kits that they made. This was the one that Ed Wood filmed. I have two of them. And they were the, the threads are still in them and everything. Yeah, and you can see the little square That's box on the bottom. Square box they put on the bottom. To match this. Yeah. Ray Mercer did those effects for that. I introduced Plan Nine from Outer Space at the TCM Movie Film Festival. You let me borrow it. I must have been drunk. Well, the, I'm telling you, dude. I was driving around with one of Ed Wood's saucers in my car. And I felt like I had the Ark of the Covenant in my car. And I took it over by Bob Goldthwaite to, for Bob Goldthwaite to see, who also yeah. is a big Ed Wood freak. Yeah. And like he did, he went pale. I'm like, you're holding in your hand one of the. Isn't that and funny? how did you come into possession of those? Did he give you the saucers himself? No, or? no. Matter of fact, no, he didn't. How I got those was totally by accident. Mercer Studios was moving from Hollywood to Burbank or something. A friend of mine worked for him. Mercer Studios was the it, effects it, company that yeah, did the, the effects, effects for Plan 9. They did the effects. They, 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 and all the cattle were running on the right. stock footage and crap and all right. that came from them. And they actually did the saucer things. So they were having a sale of a bunch of old stuff. 
just going to sell it out, get rid of it. So this friend of mine, Bill, said, why don't you come on over? There might be some stuff. There's some old airplanes and stuff from probably back in the 30s or something. And I said, okay. Right. And I got two big boxes of stuff for $35 just to get them out of there. Right. And some stuff was junk and some stuff was some really cool stuff in there. And I looked down toward the bottom of the box. like, wait a minute, one saucer, <laughs> two saucers. Wait a minute. Now, the third one, they burnt. Did I show you the little one I have that was made out of metal? Yes, it's right they on the shelf. made a little one out of metal. So I asked Bill, and he looked, he had a, a, a thing there of all the stuff they'd done. He said, yeah, right here, it's right here. Listen, they did the saucers and some other stuff for him. Well, I knew Ed Wood pretty well and used to get around with him. I mean, I get mad when people say he was a charlatan and he, and he just got money to drink right. or whatever, you know. No, it wasn't. I mean, he drank later, of course, yeah. but he didn't at first. No, he, he made got, four movies. Yeah. I, I don't care what you say That's about right. him. That's right. He got four movies and got him released. made you and bet. released. Yep. And uh, he was he was a nice guy. Oh, he just had such a great atmosphere all around him. He could talk people into doing anything. The reason that I love Plan 9 so much. Yeah. And I will say I think this is captured beautifully in Ed Wood as well, the movie. Yes, I thought so. Clearly, he loved what he was doing. Oh, man. Did he he loved those movies. Yeah. He loved doing it. And the fact that he wasn't necessarily a brilliant filmmaker never entered into it. That no. would not get in the way because yeah. of, because he right. was an, an enthusiast. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about Plan 9 and, it's a, and the yeah. beautiful thing about Ed Wood. And oh, yeah. the fact that you were there and you knew him, I well, I got to go on the set when they were shooting it, at the graveyard set, when the tombstones were falling over. And he said, nobody's ever going to notice it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you were there. Yeah. I found him to be a really nice guy. Just before he died... I lost contact with him years, and I get a call from him, and he sounds drunk, and he was. He and his wife were living in their car, and he was trying to make a comeback. He had done the smut movie thing. Right. And I think they didn't work well for him and all that crap. And he came by, and the uh, the guard at our place said, uh, Bob, it's a guy down here. He wants to see you, but I think he's a little drunk or something. I'm not sure. Why don't you come down and see if you want to? see him and i recognized him you know he looked he was all bloated by then yeah because he was a good looking guy when he was young yeah handsome fellow yeah but he was all bloated by then like his hair was way down you know what i mean and uh, he said bob how are you man and all this stuff so i took him where our little coffee shop was at right. cbs and gave him some coffee and stuff i was sure he'd wanted bourbon first but right. gave him that and he said well bob you know I, I i you know i haven't seen you in a long time but i'm looking up all my old friends i'm going to do another movie and i really need some money and I said, well, I can't help you. I, I don't have any much money at all, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I had 50 bucks on me, and I gave him the 50 bucks, knowing it was probably going to go right into a bottle. Yeah. I knew it. I couldn't turn him down. Sure. I just couldn't do it. And it wasn't, oh, I don't know, maybe six months after that's when he died. And, uh, I mean, because he was at – And that was like close. in the early 70s, yeah. mid-70s? And so Ed Wood still owes you 50 bucks. And I haven't forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you, one of these days, I know where he's buried. So if you had to recommend three movies to people like for the holidays, Ooh. Invasion of the Body Snatchers 78. The Philip Kaufman remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Watch it as an adult and you will see. And also they do the excess thing where they're constantly laying in weird sounds on the soundtrack. Uh -huh. So from the get-go, you're just unnerved and it never lets up. Yeah, never lets up. And the yeah. good guys lose. It's right. horrifying. Never lets up. I would <clears> say <throat> if you haven't seen it, definitely worth seeing. The 1972 TV movie, The Night Star. Yes, it really, and that's another great example of how to take, they clearly didn't have the biggest budget, so okay, so what can we do? We'll do the Steven Spielberg method of laying in horrifying clues and mm -hmm. ominous things, so the whole atmosphere has, and also they do this, Larry Linville is the coroners, yes. and, and early on, they also do that great thing where they set it as hard into reality as they can. It was advertised as, reporter chases a man who thinks he's a vampire. Exactly. And also, if you watch the movie, they set it up of, well, there's some lunatic yeah. killing people, and you know how, and they're kind of referencing like Manson, or like these guys, yeah. they go nuts. They well, think, they say, he's high on pot for right, the yeah, hard stuff. Yeah, exactly. So they're laying in, and everyone, there's enough evidence for it not to be supernatural, so then when the yeah. supernatural comes, it comes down like a ton of bricks. Yeah. It is, it's really scary. And there's a great creepy line in it when they find the second body. Mm-hmm. They're standing there and they go, 
how did she get down there? They're in a gravel pit. I remember this. And there's yeah. no, oh, go fuck. And he goes, just, there's no footprints. And there's this creepy line where Jeremy Gavin just goes, what did you do, throw her? It's yeah. so creepy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember very, there's a, they, they specifically do a long shot of the body yeah. with this smooth, undisturbed gravel. Yeah. Down and if you watch the movie, true. you can see in the foreground of the long shot, <laughs> the cameraman and the director's shadow. <laughs> oh, perfect. There you go. A great creepy moment. Yeah. If this is the holidays yeah. and you want to watch a really good spooky, I know that it, again, I know that it's very, very cliche, but I just rewatched it. The movie John Carpenter's Halloween. Oh. Only because, so- again, I would rather, if my daughter was 14 or 15, I'd have her watch Halloween before I had her watch a lot of these older movies, which have, you know, Halloween is, the yeah. monster is ostensibly defeated, and it's all, it's not very gory, and it's all just things popping up. It's almost like a yeah. brilliantly done fun house. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? And it also teaches her that sex is evil, which I yeah. really need to nail. Yeah. Well, <laughs> also, uh, uh, It Follows will teach you that. <clears throat> oh, Jesus Christ. And also, if you live in L.A., it's fun to go, oh, Jesus, that's orange. I, I know right, that's yeah. around the corner from Meltdown. I know right where they're well, shooting I, this. I went to see It Follows with Alex Sulkin, if you know Alex Sulkin. He's the Sulk on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a scene where they, just a naked old man on a roof. <sighs> and Alex <laughs> just goes, I got the part! <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, community theater! I'm going to Hollywood! There's a newer horror movie that came out last year called The Babadook. Oh, The Babadook is great. <laughs> is... I didn't realize it was a Kickstarter movie. They started it yeah. with Kickstarter funds. It is, and especially if you're a new parent, that is terrifying. Yeah. Halloween's always there. People are going to watch it. Go seek out the yeah, Babadook. The Babadook is wow, great. Wow, is that fucking scary. Keeping my 70s mm-hmm. uh, theme, House of Dark Shadows. Okay. Highly recommended. Nice. I got to go watch that. I've never seen it. It's very good. Okay. It's very good. I'm remembering it. For, right, right, there's right. There's a lot of great stuff in it. And I'm kind of split on my last one. Let's hear it. Carnival of Souls. Oh, fuck. Just fuck. a great movie. Great. And just one of those movies like Orson Welles is the trial that comes the closest to recreating what it actually feels like to have a nightmare. Nightmare, yeah. It has nightmare a lot, especially near the end when she's when reality just starts unraveling right. and you're like, wow, this is yeah. amazing. Also because I saw it mm-hmm. in the perfect <laughs> circumstance. Okay. A dark Cold, windy October night. Holy shit. The night before we took our PSATs. Oh, boy. Me and my friends from high school went to see an American werewolf in London. Yeah. Per- we got out cold, windy, leaves everywhere. Oh, yeah. That's perfect. The scene, Flawless, perfect. Everyone talks about, obviously, the transformation scene because it's so well done. But the dream. All the dream sequences. The Russian great. dream sequences. The, right? Yeah, the Russian nesting secret. dolls where yeah. they just won't end. Yeah. But people don't give enough credit to the scene on the moors, which is where great. there's it's jaws on land. Yeah. You just hear this thing, and David Naughton and Griffin Dunn really play people panicking perfectly, yes, and it makes do. you panicky when he goes, "Isn't this fun?" Tra la la la, and yeah. it's like this is exactly what I would be doing. I would be so terrified. And then there's that moment when they're trying to be very snide. It's almost that kind of National Lampoon kind of zippy humor until they go, "Oh, it's circling us." Ah, uh, shit. And then yeah. all pretense is gone. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is real. We can't smart Alec our way out of this. That sequence is so scary. And National Lampoon. So well done. The advertising tagline for that movie was from the director of Animal House, dot, 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 a different kind of animal. <laughs> uh, no. Well, that's what that was. Oh, God. That's well, all I'm saying. Not I good. was there, man. Yeah. I can tell you. You were uh, there, man. Last, <laughs> last one. I get okay, uh, this is one that I saw when I was a little kid. Again, shown on TV in the middle of the day, an early 70s movie that you bring it up early 70s. It's called Let's Scare Jessica, Jessica to, to Death. <laughs> Fuck. Oh. That, again, this movie, that was the first time that I understood, because I think Let's Scare Jessica to Death looks like it cost $400 to make. They oh. just shot it in the end, but it looks real it looks oh, like it's actually so happening because they just shoot it in people's houses and towns yeah. and and it's this woman who is, has gotten out of a mental institution and she comes back home so she's a little fragile but then real sh- it, it's yeah, the thing of so great hey guess what the barking loon is absolutely right right and, and if, oh fuck and they it, mm, mm. and in our early 70s double feature we the b-side to that 45 would be when michael calls 
Oh, yeah, that's another fucking weird one, isn't it? Go watch them all. Yeah, but let's scare Jessica. Here's what's so scary for me was you're talking about a windy October night, which that is scary. But this was yes. 11 a.m. on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, and then I have to go walk around my neighborhood yeah, awful. after let's scare. But most of which takes place during the daytime. Oh, it's awful, it's and it's awful. just this suburban community. So then it's like go out and play. We've just she comes you out. Of, com- yeah, she comes out of the lake in the afternoon. I know. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. So there's no. You don't even get the thing of like, well, I can play until it's dark i'll be f- there's not there's nowhere yeah. to hide yeah so, oh man. that fucking movie and Ugh. when she's and when she's doing the the rubbings on the tombstones yeah. and oh god i remember that good night children <laughs> we're so glad you made the scene it's the dana gould hour happy halloween This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jolinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey... If you enjoyed the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. The Dana Gould Hour. Once you've heard us, we're in your brain forever. It's true. Ask science. <laughs> <laughs>